happened in the 90s. Uh... We are here today to talk about tomorrow. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow will soon be today. And it seems like only yesterday when I was sleeping. The juice is, the juice is loose, the juice You are the wave of the future. The juice is loose. Starburst fruit juice with real fruit juice. Well, hey, boys and girls, this is Steve G and Matt G with Happened in the 90s, a show where we talk about things that happened in the 90s. So get out your Avarex jackets and your 316 T-shirts because we got the baddest mama jammas in all of Alabama. Give me a hell yeah for Jacqueline Phillips and Joseph Lozada of CTS Interview Room. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> these guys, look at these champions, Steve. We got Grace today. Not only do we get Joe, we get two guests for the price of one here. I mean, this is amazing. Mm. I, I, I could have done, but I, I was going to do the Dusty Roads because that, that's more Southern, but it's like, no, I've, I've done enough Dusty lately. <laughs> Got to know when to so, hold them. <laughs> some of the baddest mama jammas in all of Alabama, baby. Get funky like a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I should have done that one. I should have fucking... You, you know. fucked up, Steve. <sighs> well, welcome oh. to the show, guys. Thanks for coming oh, I, on. I got to say, that was the probably the, one of the best introductions. I've done many podcasts. I've, I've done many shows. I got to say, after doing a Dusty Rose impersonation, this has got to be the greatest introduction ever in the history <laughs> of all podcasts. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're going to have to step up our game, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> it, so you're, you're the head honcho of CTS Interview Room, and it looks like you started summer of last year. It's in uh, June. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, very much. Uh, it's weird because uh, what my cousin and I started is definitely blowing up to something that we, you know, when we started this for Raphael, it was just something to do, you know. And for me, it was like, you know what? I, I'm not on the road no more because I'm a licensed private investigator. And I, I'm still on the I, I wouldn't say that I'm not doing it, but I'm not on the road like I was. Uh, you know, I was traveling from Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, and in North, even North Carolina at some points. And I was always on the road, and I found myself at home. And we started trying to do a, a podcast, and – Long story short, and what it comes to today, with the help of, of course, Jacqueline, uh, Marvin Constant, comedian Stephen uh, Stephen Brown, Stephen M. Smith from Touchdown Alabama Magazine, uh, Internet Sensation Stingray, Clemson Tom, uh, Justin Riley, and I mean it's it's gotten to the point where it's like it's unstoppable. I think uh, we will. Without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm saying this with as humble as I can, I think we could probably go to the, the mountaintop to like bar store sports or 24-7. It's going to take some time. However, I think we can get there. And it's great that you said that. It's it's, it's a process, man. But like I've, I've watched like enough of your videos to realize that like you are in this, like regardless, like – no matter what happens, like I'm in this dog. Like I, this is oh, yeah. there's something about this podcasting that I enjoy, and it shows. It, it shows in your interaction uh, with with your cohorts, man. Well, also- I, I appreciate I appreciate that, but it, it's also a hidden agenda to it. You know, CTS stands for Carolyn Stretcher Shop, and right. the C stands for Carolyn. And uh, you know, I'm doing this. I don't mean to sound cliche, however, uh. You know, I'm doing this in honor of my mother. And, you know, she was a woman that was very important to me. And when she was alive, you know, I fe- always kind of felt, and you know, I don't want to say anything to disrespect my mother by no means, but uh, she wasn't appreciated. And in her death, I want the name Carolyn 
to always be remembered somehow, some way. And, uh, you know, selfishly, if yeah. even if I have like one subscriber, I will always have this YouTube channel and I will always carry it on. I'm not going to give it up. And, you know, I will push to the moon and back to make sure this becomes a success. That's fantastic. I mean, uh, sorry to hear about your mother, Joey, uh, but yeah. that's a great tribute to her. And it's okay. She didn't like me. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's also what I like. You know, Steve was giving you some flowers, but I love that not only do you love podcasting and it shows, but you also are fostering other people's talent and sort of bringing them under the banner of CTS Interview Room. And uh, I think that's a, a great way not only to collaborate with people, uh, but to build like a podcast universe, like you have your own universe of characters and all these people that you can have on that is self-contained into that one banner. And I, that's something that me and Steve are trying to do too. It's, it's an inspiration. Well, uh, that's interesting. You say that cause it's almost like before we press record, you was like, you're depressed professor Xavier. And we got this bunch of, bunch of X-Men. And you know what? We kind of do look at it that way. I mean, if you look at comedian Steve Brown, you know, he's he's got his own YouTube show. Uh, yeah, we talk like this. It's a very good YouTube show. Uh, I'm honestly a fan of his. The Internet Sensation Stingray, you know, Toss.0, uh, SEC Network. He's been He's done it all. Uh, Clemson Tom, uh, he's been on major networks. He's the biggest Clemens football fan of all time. Then you got all SEC linebacker Marvin Constant, who's who's considered a legend in Alabama from a play he did back in 1999 to make sure Alabama continues to go on to the national championship, which they didn't do, but they went on to win the SEC championship. Uh, Justin Riley, Stingray, Steve, Touchdown Alabama Magazine, Stephen M. Smith, uh, all a big help to making this uh, successful. Now adding Jacqueline on, who's great at marketing, who's great at, uh, you know, writing and talking, which is something that I'm probably, as you probably can tell that I'm not very good at. Uh, we are definitely going to, I believe in my heart that we're definitely going to do something very special. And, you know, and you take Jacqueline, for example, she has a book. Uh, she's an author. She's, she, uh, What's it called when you take pictures, Jacqueline? What's Photographer. It yeah, she she has her own business. She's an entrepreneur. She is she's a wife. She's a mother. A great human being. Someone who I got the utmost respect for, and I mean that humbly and honestly. Everybody has their own power outside. You know, Raphael. Uh, he you know he's a actor and entrepreneur himself and a construction worker. Uh, Marvin Constant just opened up a business called 40 Plus Strong. Jacqueline's a business lady. We all got something outside of CTS that uh, Stingray has his own network as well, the Stingray Show. We all have something outside of CTS. However, when we come together, we all try to build this one brand. And our goal is to make this brand into something very successful. And it looks like you in the recent months you guys have been evolving really longer than that uh you know if you if you look at the page it's uh, there's a lot of sports it's it's heavily involved with alabama football but there are interviews with comedians with uh different performers and like you said uh even historians so you're you're slowly growing into something bigger than what you initially thought or initially saw that's the beauty of the banner not having yeah. the name sports in it is we're able to expand and really make yeah. the network into what we want it to be. And the fact that we can have, you know, the basis in Alabama sports and then expand from there. You know, we told a great interview of the story of Phoenix city, Alabama, which was coming up on its, its landmark case and being able to pull that history in and complement not only Alabama sports, but Alabama history. It's a really neat opportunity that we've created for ourselves. I agree. And it's more encompassing because, I mean, if you're, if you're doing something that's covering Alabama football in Alabama, as we all know, that's one of the hotbeds for college football, always has been. So there's immediately going to be a huge market for that. Now, if you're talking and expanding that to the history of Alabama, anyone who's from there, that, that's, a, that's more, grab, more of a grab ball. And it, it looks like you, you've even interviewed uh, Bill Ingball and 
Yes. I mean, I, that that publicist probably got fired that <laughs> the next day. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you. We talk about. Let's get back to the the Phoenix City interview. You know, okay. the we the Phoenix City uh, is the hometown where it's my hometown, and John Patterson, the governor, uh, former governor of Alabama passed away. I didn't know. I was doing, I wanted to do a special on the Phoenix City story and back it up on the Phoenix City story, mafia, gambling, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So he passes away, you know, he helped clean up the town, but he became governor. And I noticed that everything was about, it was an incident that happened in Anniston, Alabama with the Freedom Riders that, you know, he was a segregationist and, you know, and when you saw all the stuff that came in the reports, it was basically all the negative stuff that he did as a governor, which is, is deserved. I mean, it's not to say that it wasn't deserved. It's just, it just kind of left out what happened prior to that, how he helped clean up a town from gambling, the mafia and all that stuff. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that he passed away. So I got the, the mayor of Phoenix City, who's... Uh, of course, a uh, famous Alabama football player uh, who is now the mayor of my hometown. And we did an interview and Jacqueline conducted the interview and we mm-hmm. wanted to, you know, show light on what happened in Phoenix City. Not just what happened in 1962 and, you know, all the negative stuff that happened. We wanted to show the light to what this man accomplished prior to that. And because when, <laughs> when you get a story like the Phoenix City story, and it got a movie. There's been many books written about it, and and but everybody in the press is talking about just four years of governors and just all the negative stuff. I was kind of like, what about Phoenix City? I mean, I get it. And what happened in the Anniston, Alabama, with the bomb uh, bus bombing was very bad, and it's something that haunted him for the, his whole life, but. You know, his father being murdered by gangsters <laughs> and a town being cleaned up. I mean, it was like and, our, our, our town deserved that that moment. You know what I mean? And it got taken away. I felt. And, and what was his name? Uh, John Patterson. John Patterson. But, but the Bill Ingvall interview was definitely uh, something that was a, a very get. We had a he got up at six o'clock in the morning and uh he we interviewed him and uh that was uh interesting uh to say the least because you could tell that you know he was tired he was sleepy and we were tired and sleepy too and uh but it was an honor to get to interview him and uh i don't think he's he's ever going to come back <laughs> but <laughs> why, why is that <laughs> because uh after the end of the show stingray was trying to you know, pitch him to come on his network. And being that, as you can tell, I'll talk a lot. And being that uh, I have no filter, I was uh, listening to Steam Ray pitch about coming on his show. And you got to understand when you get, you you guys know, when you get guests on a show, you got to go through a publicist and uh, agents yeah. and stuff like that. You can't just ask the talent. So to be funny, I decided to, uh, while Stingray was talking, I said, yeah, can you come and do my, my kid's birthday party too? Now, thinking in my head, <laughs> Bill Ingvall is going to bust out laughing. He's going to go, oh, my God, that's the funniest guy ever. He needs to go on the road with me. And I picture, like, millions of dollars being sprinkled on my bed because I just made this joke to Bill Ingvall, and he was going, he thinks it's so funny. And we always going to get a good yeah. laugh about it, man. That man, when as soon as I said it, that man looked into the camera like this. No. Hey. And not only that, I started laughing like very uncomfortably. And then he said, "Okay, guys, I got to go." Click. Hey, Joseph, can I, I can I be real with you, bro? I like, man. If I was there with you and I, you told me you were gonna say that, I would have been like, man, that's probably not a good idea. That's probably not gonna land, bro. Uh, and where were you? Where were you two, three months ago? Come man, on, I, 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 I wish I could have been there. Bro. 
Cause, because the, like he's the way he's probably looking at it is like he's trying to undermine me. Like, wait, look, I'm one of the like yeah. kings of comedy, whatever. Like, you want me to perform at your kid's birthday? Like, that's how he's probably I'm sure that's how he looked at it. I mean, I, I had a similar you know, situation happen with Fred Durst in L.A. I live in L.A. and I saw him just at a store and I and I've explained this to Steve and since figured out why I fucked up. But I walked up to the guy. This was probably like seven years, maybe eight years ago. And I was like, Fred, I used to love your music. And I you put the used to. I don't see, know why. I like I don't Jacqueline, know why. You see exactly. Jacqueline, I don't know yep. why. But again, he did not appreciate that. This, what you yeah. said. I mean, it, I, I feel like what you said was less spicy than what I said. In hindsight, you know what? Like, hey, to all defense, uh, I used to like his music too. And keyword used to. <laughs> See, there, there you was know a time to break stuff every can, once in a while. It, though. You're not gonna hear, hear me bust out. I, I did it all for the nookie ever again. I that's because you're married. In 1999, it was cool. It was totally a thing. Yeah, it's, that's just not. Nah. But uh, well, when was the cutoff date for you and Limp Biscuit? Who, for me? Yeah. Oh, probably their last, uh, probably, t- probably uh, the Star that album, oh, about 2002, Chocolate maybe. Starfish. All That's right. Two- <laughs> I had one, li- I had one Limp Biscuit <laughs> album, and I probably listened to three songs on there. Because, you know, other? back in the day, since this is the 90s show, you know, back, kids, if you, you're listening, back in the day, we used to have this thing called Albums. And we used to like listen to a song on the radio. And for me personally, I would go and buy a CD. Like I, I like a song and I would go buy the album and yeah. then I will kill that one or two songs. And, you know, I, it, as I got older, I listened to the whole album. But back in the 90s, I was just listening to that one song. Kill it. Like it was a CD called the band called The Verb. And they had a. Yeah. A song called Bittersweet Sympathy. Sympathy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. And I only listened to that one song. I never, and to this day, I never heard the whole album. Hey, Joey, <laughs> everybody else, but I don't think anybody knows any other Verve song other than that one fucking song. <laughs> Wait, they, they made other songs? <laughs> I was about to say, I think yeah, I thought they, they had just, whole like, crashed in a plane after that. They recorded that one thing, it was great, and that was it. <laughs> had, dude, had me fooled. Like, I don't remember. You used to be able to go to Sam Goody and buy the song. You like yeah, you could sing- get the taste single. singles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I used to do that too, but you know, back when it was cassettes. But yeah, you know, uh, it, I remember uh, one time it was a Montel Jordan song. You know, this is how we do it. But then oh, yeah. on the back side, excuse me, on the back side they had this song. Uh, it was something a for the honeys. Song. No, it, it was nah, a, one. it was one is another song on his album. It was a sexual song, and I was listening to it, and my mom walked in, and I, I forgot the lyrics of it, but I just remember uh, my mom walked in listening, hearing me listening to it, and I was just you know doing something. I guess I was looking at my notebook during school, and here listening to this man talk about sex. I, my mom was just walked in, and she was like. <laughs> Where's that baseball band <laughs> trying to destroy my stereo? No, it's Montel Jordan. You know, it's 1993, and I'm like 11, 10, 9, something years old. But, you know, my mom didn't keep up with – you know, she bought the Chronic album to, for my sister oh, in man. 92, and she didn't know Which what is, Chronic was. Oh. So – it's, it's, see, yeah, I, I feel like times have changed. Like everybody's kind of grown hip to what these different terms mean. Because like in sixth grade, man, I, I won the spelling bee and I wore a Snoop Dogg doggy style hockey jersey. And I was in sixth grade and this was in front of the whole elementary uh, school. And it, because it was 95, I don't think teachers were hip to what doggy style was. You know, do you understand? You know how many times my mom used to go around telling everybody, like, you don't love me, you just love my doggy style. What in the fuck? Not knowing. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I went to, I never forget the day she found out. I went to my mom's work to uh because I didn't know what it meant either. You know, I'm being I was very, very young. And mm. I go to my mom's work and she said, Okay, I love you. 
I said, yeah, mom, you know, you don't love me. You just, Joey, stop. <laughs> I said, no. I mean, being, I'm like, I'm going to get this sentence out, damn it. We say this all the time. Like, proud of this, we would go around saying this at home and laughing because we heard it on the music video. And she's like, no, stop. Don't say it. Stop, Joey. Stop. Stop. <laughs> and I'm like, you listen here, woman. You don't love me. <laughs> you love me from my doggy yeah. style. And everybody's looking at us like, oh, you know. That's not we're how down this works. OPP. Yeah, this family's yeah. crazy. I mean, damn it. We're down with OPP. <laughs> Do you know me? I mean, come on. I remember wearing yeah. the shirt saying, you know, we're down with OPP. And we're in elementary school. And you're like nine. And nobody <laughs> knows what the hell is talking. Nobody, nobody said nothing. Nobody knew what it meant. That's Alabama for you. <laughs> and what part of Alabama? I, I grew up in Phoenix City, Alabama. Phoenix City, that's right. And Jacqueline, you're the only one out of the tandem that doesn't really have Alabama ties, correct? No, correct. I'm too. located no. in Phoenix, Arizona. No. Born and raised? Yes. She's not the only one. Oh, she oh she's not. Who who's the other? No. My cousin Raphael, he's he lives in Harlem. Grew up, born and raised oh, in Harlem. Uh, Raphael, man, okay. Raphael, dude. Hey, got a man crush. J Joseph, I am the president of the Raphael fan club. Uh, I, I watched the videos of you and him together, and that is comedic gold because you two have this dynamic that is just like you have an agenda for the video, right? And you kind of like you you go you have a list you're prepared and I've seen this on countless occasions you you got your game plan you know what you're going to say and he's just always assured of himself and I admire that he's got his shades on and so a lot of times I don't know if he's serious or if he's joking uh, because no, he says things joking. in a very he's serious he, he, yeah okay yeah that makes it even greater. Because it's effing hilarious, man. And like, shout out to Raphael, man. If you ever see this, man, hey, dude, you're. This, he he was supposed to be in front of a camera. That's <laughs> oh yeah, he knows it too. So does Jacqueline. Jacqueline knows she's supposed to be in front of the camera too. If if I'm giving a shout out to her Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you you sidetracked me with That's Raphael, exactly. and I, I had to I had to. Throw, give my flowers right quick, man. No, that's but yeah. okay. Give love to the OG. I'm, I'm still the new kid. <laughs> but like, I asked you a little bit be about your history um, before we recorded. So you mind telling the folks like how you guys met in the first place? So basically Joey had interviewed me on the interview room for CTS. And, yeah. you know, it was a bit of a rough start, but we made it through. I was still really new and green to this whole podcasting yeah. thing because I was promoting a book. And if you've never been a self-promotion kind of person, it's the most foreign thing in the world to be like, check me yeah. out. Um, contrary to appearances, I'm not really that person. So it was very new and foreign. And we, we muddled through. And then the opportunity came to, hey, I've got this interview. And you're really good at speaking. And you ask really good questions. Why don't you do it with me? And then we got a couple of interviews under our belt. And he said, you know, why am I wasting my time? Why don't you just take them over? So then I got adopted into the interview room and I do some of the behind the scenes work to grow the brand visibility of CTS. And I'm just the pretty one in the group. No <laughs> doubt. And, and you, like you are on, are, blah, blah. can I speak today? You're also an author. I No, I can't. You're also an author. Uh, you mind telling us a bit about your book? Absolutely. So Comfortably Uncomfortable, The Road to Happiness Isn't Always Paved is a guide for getting through the past that is holding you back and how to move forward and be successful and happy and have self-love and act with love in your heart. So it's an inspirational memoir. Yeah. I, I mean, need to pick that, up a copy of that fucking book, Steve. I need some. It's for, man, you don't love yourself enough. <laughs> Thank you. Most of us don't know how. We weren't taught how. And it's, it feels very foreign. It's, it's a lot of imposter syndrome when you're trying to learn how to love yourself and find authenticity in it because it feels really hokey until just like exercise, you practice it over and over and over. You know, you practice to perform. 
And every day there's a performance where you have to say, at the end of the day, I gave my absolute best in everything that I could do, even if it was a terrible day, I'm still proud of who I am and what I accomplished. Yeah. Even on the worst days, you still have to have that. And that's where that your, practice comes in. Your daily victories, you got to count them. And um, they don't have to be big. And I, I, I feel like the these kind of way. conversations are being held in public only recently. Um, for years, for ages, we've been taught to just pray it away and just, you know, give everything mm-hmm. to God. And that's fine. Like if that, if that's what you want to practice, but I mean, how about talking to a specialist here? Check, check what's up here. Because a lot of people are going out seeking love when they don't even love themselves. And you know, how is that possible? Uh, a lot of us just overlook it a lot of times, you know, Jacqueline. And, and, you know, you look at somebody like Jacqueline and I, I'm butt in and, she, you know, and I mean this, you know, she's somebody that, you know, you know, we make jokes and, and Jacqueline's a very, uh, how you say, not, I don't want to say sexual person, but a very, you know, like a BSer and you can joke around with her, you know, like guy jokes. One of the boys. But you take that, at, you know, and we make a lot of jokes and crazy stuff like that, but you don't know how much re- respect is the key it is like how much respect we have for this woman. Uh, we mean this like, like we look up like personally for me, she's like a hero. Like she's uh, somebody I look up to. Yeah. We're not talking about, we're not, you know, she portrays, you know, yeah, we're like we're in the locker room, like, you know, locker room joking around and stuff because she has no filter. But but everything that she has accomplished is everything that I want to accomplish. So when I say that, you know, she's like a hero of mine, I mean that like humbly. Like, I mean, it's like I look up to her. Uh, I admire her. She's somebody that I want to be like. And, and that's very, you know, you really, you know, being, you know. I, as an adult, I don't look up to people. <laughs> I don't really like, you know, maybe as a kid, you know, there was Michael Jordan, Hulk Hogan, uh, yeah. Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson, you know, uh, those are the people that, you know, I look up to. But as you grow up, you stop looking up to people. And they're you people. Know, when I met Jacqueline, yeah. As, as I met Jacqueline, I was like, you know, this is who I want to be like. I wish I could be like this person. So how can like somebody like me, who doesn't look up to somebody, look up to somebody like her, but yet she doesn't see her value. You know what I mean? That's and, the and you, thing about Jacqueline. I was going to say, me. like, I, this might even be, like, kind of tie into being a 90s kid, but, like, I feel like, you know, what Jacqueline and Steve and, and you're talking about, Joey, like, communicating to people and being open with people and, like, even just giving people flowers, like, telling somebody, hey, good job. Uh, you know, I feel like... Or being honest and like talking about your feelings with a buddy like me and Steve or you guys or whoever. Like uh, we didn't used to do that. It was very much like, come on, you know, like shut up, you know, like brush it off, suck it up, Walk like it that off. kind of mentality. And like now it is more it's like I don't like anybody to compliment me uh, in the small amount of compliments I get, but it just makes me uncomfortable. And I think like getting over that and being able to just tell somebody like something that's fucked up in your life or, you know, like, thank you for something, or you're doing a great job. Like that's actually becoming something more common now. Whereas it's like people like our age have to sort of learn while we're doing it because that's not how we grew up. You know, I didn't compliment a lot of people. It was a lot of shit talking and, (laughs) you know, like complimenting somebody by making a joke about them or with them type shit. That's that's actually the title of book number two, Quit Talking Shit. (laughs) Yes, I love you. (laughs) Because that's what we do. That's, That's how we regulate the world around us. We talk shit about it and it's not healthy. Yeah. And it. I'm guessing Jacqueline is the strong friend and you know, everyone has that strong friend or two, but a lot of people overlook the fact that like that strong friend is a person, that strong friend is a human being. And, you know, despite that the person might wear it well, um, you never know. So sometimes it's good to hear such things, you know, like uh, for your friends, your, your compadres to, uh, remind you of your strengths and how great of a person you are. Um, because it's taken for granted when, when you're that strong friend all the time, every time. 
Hey, you should hear some of the nice stuff that Jacqueline says to me. She says stuff. It's so funny. She says something like, yeah. you know, I'm going to kill you uh, when I meet you in person. I'm going to stab you. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. She's just such nice things. Is it unprofessional Man. to block you already? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we're gonna have to put an APB out for you, man. I was about to say, God man, damn. look, hey, look, man, I'll tell I'll be straight up. If I had a the amount of enemies I have just because of this right here, it, it's it's unprecedented. <laughs> I, I don't the same person you see today is the same person you see me at a former dinner. It, I don't, I've just I do not have that uh the you know the social like I can't change who I am, you know. When you go into the room and you're with like people who are millionaires or something, you know, classy people, I'm the same person that I am here, that I am at a bar, that I am at in a restaurant, that I'm at at a former dinner, that I am at church. <laughs> yeah. Basically, he just wants to be compared to Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. That's all. Yes, very <laughs> much so. Don't we all? Yes, yes. I I love Julia Roberts, and I would love to be her. So, she is she your hottie of the nineties? No, by no means. By no means. Wow. No, Sorry, I wouldn't Julia. say she was. I think she was. Per, no, nineties hottie. For me. Wow. You, There's too many to name. Know, you know, you know, it's funny. We sat here for like 30 minutes talking about the CTS and we didn't even start to talk about the 90s. And this is what we signed up for. Now, now we get oh, into, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Oh, we'll get, yeah, we're, we're easing in. Yeah, we're, 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 we're getting into the bread and butter now. Thank you, Jesus. Got the, got the uh, toe in the shallow end. <laughs> uh, hottie in the 90s. You know, I was a big wrestling fan. Sonny was uh, probably one of the hot. Nice hot. I'm talking about hot ladies. Uh, who else? You know, and I come in. You know, after I leave the show, I'll probably think about twenty thousand other women. Okay, so Alanis like, uh, Alanis Ooh, Morissette too. That's a uh, good one. Indy is yeah. I, I definitely. Agree. I wouldn't say I, I wasn't dreaming about her like I was Sunny, but uh, uh, then you got uh. Sh- Guys, are we gonna Anderson. forget about Pamela Anderson? I oh, mean, Pamela on, Anderson! Geez. Yes, uh. <laughs> Pamela okay. Anderson. Oh my God, she was okay. Joe, so I, like, I, I have to ask you since you're a wrestler fan, you're around the same age as us, man. You grew up watching it in the '80s and '90s, right? Oh yeah, most definitely. So Matt gives me shit about Sensational Sherry. Uh, he he Hot. puts her down, like. Hot. Wait, thank you. Thank you. And, and I really feel like he is just under the ruse that she's hideous because that's how her character was presented. Even, because even as he, a four year old, I was sitting there thinking, I know she's bad, but I can see up her skirt. She had the you know, fishnets. She would rock them fishnets. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. She was gorgeous. And, you know, it's see, sad that she's not. How with did us, I know but, you were going to bring up sensational Sherry in this interview? I, look, I man, I, 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 I knew there was coming. Be, be, because you and your idealistic uh, standards, like, oh, she has to like, no, man, I Sherry has you. some beauty. She was not scary in real life. She was actually hot. Thank you, Joseph. No, she was actually hot. She was gorgeous. And I, Miss Elizabeth. I'm being painted as a villain here, but I'm not. I'm just saying, was she the Maybe hottest your mustache. WWF diva? Absolutely not. Wait, did y'all remember Miss Elizabeth? Oh yeah. yeah, of course. Uh, okay, like yeah. she was everybody's idea of woman. Uh, like if I had to like go back in time, I'm not gonna tell my wife this, but if I had to go back in time, the woman that I wanted to marry was somebody like Miss Elizabeth, like just a nice, shy, beautiful, you know, Steve you know, Martin 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 sensational beater. Sherry or Luna Vachon even. Uh, well, you know, I like the, but see, see, as I got older, I like the bad girls, but you know. <laughs> The but as a child, I mean, Macho Man used to beat the hell out of her. You know, he put her in front of Hulk Hogan, like hit her, don't yeah. hit me, and she was always right there. She's like, I love you, Macho Man. You know, you, you <laughs> want a woman, <laughs> you want a woman like that. Uh, but no, uh, yeah, Miss Elizabeth and Sensational Sherry was definitely two of the most gorgeous women in professional wrestling. Oh, what do you Jacqueline, think, Jacqueline? 
Yeah, I was going to say, we need a female perspective. Well, Jacqueline, or, I mean, guy, girl, who was your hottie of the 90s? Well, I'm old school. I love Cindy Crawford. She will forever be timeless for me. Um, mm. my, my guilty pleasure was Christian Slater. And the fact that he's now on Dr. Death is just the best. <laughs> uh, Johnny Depp was still, you know, in his crybaby phase. So he was good looking. You know, Emilio Estevez before he got a big gut because the Mighty Ducks made him look really good because he was redeemable. Um, you know, there was also 90210 and the mm. Dylan Brandon thing. I mean, woo! Hey, can I okay. ask you, we just talked about 90210. Just quick, rapid fire thought. When I say Ian Zeering, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Nepotism. Okay. I, it's your shirt on, Steve. Yeah. Why does his name have to be Steve? <laughs> you know, y'all talk about hot Jenna, Jenna Presley. We forgot about her. She was hot. Jenna is it? it oh, from uh, Versus Blues. I, I'm, I know. I'm talking about uh, the girl that played Jenna. I'm sorry. Uh, what was the blonde girl? What was? Are you talking about Jamie Priestley? Jamie? Well, no, the blonde girl in Nana Two One Zero. What's her name? Oh, Jeannie Garf. Jeannie Garf. Jeannie Garf. Mm. Garf. Uh, blah, blah, blah. See? Yes. You guys, That's need to go. you guys need to hang out. You guys got similar tastes. Yeah. Hey, 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 look, we just like hot women. I and guess. I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I like Pamela Anderson and Jenny McCarthy and Vivian. Jenny McCarthy. Forgot about C. Carmen Electra. I got starting to talk about the women that I'm like, yes, yes. Uh, it's just the one woman that came to my mind was Sunny. It's just. Because, you know, See? at the time, this is the 90s, AOL, you know, mm -hmm. internet just started. And she was like the number one downloaded woman. And if you yeah. go back in time, you know, what she is today compared to what she was in 1995 and 96 and 97, 98. Oh, my gosh. Oh. She was gorgeous. She was banging. Was sunny. She was, she was banging. You could say she started out, this gangster yeah. shit when it comes to divas. Yes. Now, hey, we got to talk, you know. That reminds me, Jacqueline. What was you listening to in the nineties? Oh, I was kind of all over the place. I I really thought I was a gangster in ninth grade, and me too. I, I was all about Mace and Puffy and Mo Money, More Problems, and the East Coast versus West Coast. And I had my flannel. So embarrassing. <laughs> me, you know, everybody. You notice everybody in the nineties was wanting to be black like yes. everybody everybody wanted to be gangster till that to that the, the Aaliyah to that men's day. underwear with the baggy pants i yeah. have that picture no that wasn't me everybody was a gangster till they met a gangster yes oh man <laughs> when they met oh, a real dude. gangster i mean oh, i was a 16 dude. year old white kid just riding around listening to every the most thuggish shit possible at full volume in Perrysburg, Ohio. There was no reason I should have owned it. Like, if you're just going by my background, I should not have been just like blaring, uh, you know, Mo Thug or whatever that song is with Tupac. Thank and you, Bone Thug. Oh, with Bone Thugs and <clears throat> Harmony and Tupac. No, Tori is the. Oh, that's the Bone. Yeah, Biggie. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, it, it's funny because where I grew up at. Uh, you know, it was a majority black town. And mm. so when, you know, you know, gangsta, every, in my school, everybody was listening to rap music. And it's funny because now I can't even turn on a rap song because it's because it just doesn't make sense to me and doesn't sound good. It's all this mumbling. And, and but it, I, I can't listen to the music I could listen to back in the day because, you know, I don't want my 10 year old listening to doggy style or. Listen to uh, you know, uh, listen to a Snoop Dogg song, and they're like, "Oh, that's Snoop Dogg." No, 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 we can't listen to "Murder Was the Case." No, no we don't need to listen to this because back in the day, wow. rap music was about busting caps and you know, excuse my language, but fucking hoes, busting yeah. caps and fucking hoes, and that and that was rap music. Now is, I don't know what rap music is about now. I, 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 I know I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to country. Not so, at all. <laughs> so what now? I, I mean, I, they're rapping about the same shit. I just said like not enjoyable for like, I like beats now. Like if a song has a good beat, but I'm not listening to the lyrics. 
So I like poetry. I, it has to. I thought rap music had a rhyme, and you know, you take about you know, even though they was talking about busting caps and and money and fucking hoes and all this stuff, they rhymed when they did it. You know. Yeah. In all yeah. fairness, though, Megan Thee Stallion can rap like nobody's business, and Cardi B's it, right it, behind it, her, and I will sing I, every word behind it. I like Megan Thee Stallion. And, oh my gosh, I mean, yes. Yeah. I will be thought shit this summer. Absolutely. I mean, I secretly like Meg the Stallion too, but I don't like people to know. Like, if I'm listening to her, it's not like it's blaring. It's in my ear, and I'm like hoping nobody knows I'm listening to it. Do y'all ever catch yourselves listening to music back back in the day that you know you didn't listen to back, like in the nineties? Like, I now I'll sit there and listen to Neon Moon by Brooks and Dunn, knowing that 20, 30 years ago I would never be caught dead listening to the song. Now all of a oh. sudden I'm listening to stuff that I like. Why am I listening to country music? But that's growth. That's yeah, that's growth, Joseph. That's appreciation. Yeah, it's like, but you know, I can see myself as a 14 year old. Like I wouldn't even be caught dead listening to this crap. But now I'm like, it's a shy, 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 and singing along to the song, and everybody's like looking at me. My kids are even looking at me like, golly, Can you please turn on Justin Bieber, golly. I, I think that's learning more about the stuff that you've already been listening to for years. And then it's like your, your interest is peaked. It's like, who are their influences? And then you start listening to that. And then it's like, you know, everything comes back to its origins. Like even with these older songs that we listen to from time to time, they get sampled and used and sometimes in commercials, like, Oh man, I, I hear that in the Burger King commercial. Oh shit. I didn't know that. That's who played that. Um, you know, you know how when, many times we fast forward commercials after we record a program and now we'll go on YouTube and watch old commercials. Man, I rely and, on that shit for our edits because I have to I use we use old commercials in all of our episodes. So thank God somebody's watching those things because we want to have some content. Dude, there are videos where there's like five hours worth of like commercials from 1993. And like, I'll watch like three hours of it because I have that kind of fucking time. And it's it's kind of like how my grandparents were. They would always watch Andy Griffith. I love Lucy because it takes them back to that time. And like now I'm 37. So I like I get it. I get it. Like the 90s was is such a special time for me and my like being around my friends. And it was just no responsibility. It, you know, it was time to be a kid, to be a teenager. And I, I hate to sound curmudgeon, but I just don't think anything can beat that decade, even like ugh, in the future. Well, yeah, you know, I love the 90s, but it, it, to me, the 90s were, is was actually, I said this to y'all in text, you know, it technically was the start of social justice. I mean, it, if you look at the first three ep- seasons, and Jacqueline, you can back me up on this because you said you, watched the real world like religiously you watch the first three seasons of the real world it's like oh my god it's, it's like that was the beginning of it you know <clears throat> you know the race issues abortions uh homosexuality and, and aids with pedro uh yeah i still remember pedro and i remember puck and, and pedro fighting and yeah. i remember uh david the comedian getting kicked out of the house for <laughs> We just yeah. talked about that just last episode. Yeah. We're kind of covering that part time. I think oh, it's you? not like that. It, I'm, to me, what sucks about that is that that's when reality TV started. And it's, it's what I hate. It, it was good, too. It was for me. It was better not then than it is now. I mean, you know, I, I still watch yeah. heartbeat. it. It kind of lifted the curtain on a world that a lot of us didn't get to see every day. And it really broadened right. our horizons. And I, I think it had a responsibility to, to show kids, you know, this is what the real world is really like. And, you know, in your tiny little white bread community with your bedroom home, you're not going to see this. So we're going to show you what this looks like because it's important. And yes, all reality shows have some level of scripting, but that was a time when it wasn't so overly scripted and overly hyped and, you had villains because they were really just shitty people, not because they had been typecast by some writer to be that way. Yeah, you were you were seeing the the human experience in a really raw format that a lot of us would never have been exposed to. 
Well, and they weren't aware, people weren't aware that if you went on a show and just acted like a complete piece of shit, that you would actually get more famous. Like back then, it was just, like you said, if you were a piece of shit, it came off because they were taping you all the time. But I think now it's like you watch like Real Housewives and stuff like that. And it's just they these people know that if they throw a glass of wine on somebody or try to slap somebody uh that they're going to be on the internet and get more famous off of it so it's all i mean i'll watch it you know i like to waste time sometimes and watch like bad girls club back in the day with my wife uh and laugh at how crazy it is but it's fucking bizarre how that evolved you know and we kind of got to witness the whole evolution of it or the early (laughs) dating shows like rock of love and love and hip hop, and you know the you know <laughs> flavor could- flame. That's when it was like the most craziest. Because I mean, I never watched Flavor of Love. I avoided it because I was like, this can't be good. And then my no, roommate at the time made me. He's like, just watch the first episode. I'm the whores are punching. Getting- the whores are punching. I mean, well, the first we'll episode into of the that t- show ever. A woman just shits herself. It, while she's standing waiting to do something and they like that's the episode it's like hey this girl got so drunk she shit herself and that's the show we'll get, i was like hey okay, we're getting in. we're get we're getting in the 2000s this that's the, you, next, that's the next podcast guys, we can yeah. talk we're not like we, strictly we, we, we get here, you know? yeah we get sidetracked a lot on this show joseph <laughs> my apologies uh <laughs> But, but e- e- even then, though, in the 90s, you had studs. I don't know if you guys remember that. And then there was a Love Connection, which was from like the 80s all the all throughout the 90s with Chuck Woolery. What, what, what was Jenny McCarthy and Criminal Singled, Singled Out? Singled Out. Yeah. That, that guy's like a big I, I nerd. See. He's like really Chris big Hardwick. in that comic. Chris Hardwick. Yeah. I, I, a bill, he's I a billionaire to, because he's a nerd. That guy's yeah. a I, I, I had to ask. You know, I see Matthew. I see a Power Ranger picture on on your. Uh, mm-hmm. Who was your who Who was your friend? Was it the Green Ranger or the White Ranger? Because I was I the mean, Green Ranger. I'm a Green uh, Ranger. He turned guy. white. I'm a purist because that's what that's the origin, and that's when he was like ba- the bad boy. He wasn't the goody two shoes. Yes, guy. but I was the green. When they when they took away the Green Ranger, I was like, man, fuck the show. Plus, he had that dope <laughs> fucking flute shit. To call this, yeah. or he did this little ocarina of time on the knife thing. That was dope. I love that. Yeah, Plus, I've he's been- a badass in real life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been to, we, there's a thing in LA that's called Power Morphicon that's like comic, Comic Con, but just for Power Rangers. And my, my wife's a journalist, so she got us free passes to it. And uh, let's say he's basically the only one who's held it together. You know, everyone I saw Bulk and Skull there and they look basically the same. But everyone else, like the Red Ranger guy, I was like, who is that? Is that a caterer? Well, no, it's that different. happens. With, I think all four of us, except for Jacqueline, because Jacqueline got the body from like a goddess. But everybody else, you know, <clears throat> get up in age. I look up at my old MySpace pictures and I got my muscles showing and I'm doing this. And, but when you get older. Kids, marriage, work, YouTube page. <laughs> you don't find yourself going to the gym as much. And uh Man, that happens. You can't you can't fault nobody like that. You know, it, it is what it is. Aren't but, uh, you guys kind of glad we didn't have smartphones in our teenage years in our early twenties? Oh. Cause I am. I think that might have been my saving grace. The fact that nobody was able to record uh my stupid shit mishaps. Yeah. Absolutely. The outfits that we wore, the songs that we sang, the the hooking up that we did. Woo. You I'm could so destroy no tapes records. too. It's like you could tape it. You could do like a camcorder tape, but you could find that and destroy the evidence. So it was still possible. Now it just goes on the cloud and it's there forever. So forever <laughs> in these internet streets. Now, I, I, I certainly admit, hope not because people are going to see some freaky shit from me. <laughs> Man, I, I could be a meme at this point. I don't know. But like, there's something I wanted to address, man. When you were talking to Clemson Tom about who's the goat, he was mad disrespectful to the Hulkster, man. And I love Stone yeah, we, Cold. Yeah, you you can't you can't disrespect the Hulkster around me. You know, I you know I, I will say this: in 2011, my first year, my one year anniversary. You know. Being that I was so close to Atlanta, uh, 
And we, I remember in 2010, the week prior to my wedding, they, WrestleMania came on. We had a bunch of friends over to my house, have a WrestleMania party. And we saw that it was going to be on April 3rd, 2010, or 2011, WrestleMania coming to Atlanta. But that was going to be April 3rd or is, was my wedding date. Mm. And uh, needless to say, I, I, I've come to realize that I wasn't going to go to WrestleMania because it would be my first year anniversary. So February 2011 comes around, and I'm watching Raw, and then come to find out the host of WrestleMania was going to be The Rock, and The Rock hadn't been seen on wrestling since 2004. And I was like, I, I went on Stull Hub. I spent $1,500. <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, I'm going to WrestleMania. Now, needs to say, I, I, that was the only professional wrestler I probably ever did that. But when you talk about nostalgia, you know, growing up, I remember Hulk Hogan coming out and I would get goosebumps and I'll get the little chills coming down my spine because Hogan's coming out and him tearing that shirt off. You knew his ass whooping time and, and he'll hook up and that end he was posing and see all the stuff that he did for professional wrestling. And somebody come out and say something like Kenny Omega or, or, or we we'll go back to Clemson Tom say, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone okay. Cold wrestled from 1989 to 2003 you know that's not a lot of years in professional wrestling hulk hogan was wrestling back in the 70s all the way to you know 2011 when, 2012 when Finn senior was running it yeah he created the structure for how like the rock is doing what he's doing i mean hulk did it already sorry he's not, not he was the first wrestler to ever host sorry not live he you know wrestle first wrestlemania yeah, I First got a wrestler championship on belt. Sports Illustrated. Suburban Commando. Please. Oh, don't okay. That's not oh. even mission of movies. <laughs> yeah, that's we talk of wrestling. We got out of this. Yeah, we got uh, some very bad movies, but you know, he he I was a big Hulkamaniac, and I'm loyal. Uh, you know, Alabama football, Atlanta Falcons, Chicago Bulls, you know, win or lose. I'm always those always gonna be my three teams. And yeah. you know, people say, Of course, he was a Bulls fan. We're talking about the 90s. Of course, I was a Bulls fan. How could you but, not be? Yeah, how can you not be? But guess what? I was also a Bulls fan with Hersher Hawkins, Brent Berry, Elton Brand, you know, Tyson Chandler, oh. Ron Artez, Ben Gordon, Kurt Heinrich, you know, Bill Cartwright was the head coach. You know, I was wow. a fan of them when they were losing. I'm a fan of them now, and they're still losing. So the Falcons, always losing. Gave up a, a 20 point lead in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I didn't turn my back on them. It, you know, I'm a, I'm loyal, and since I was a Hulk Hogan fan since I was a little kid, I'm gonna be a Hulk Hogan fan now, and I'm gonna stand up for everything he did for yeah. professional wrestling. Does that Hulk make me a is forever? <laughs> yeah, you know, NWO is for life. You know, does that make me a dork? Maybe, but you know, I'm gonna stick to Hogan, dude. And it, I, like I said, I love Stone Cold, but like the guy who brought me to the yard in the first place was Hulkster, man. The main eventer. He 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 held it down for what eight WrestleManias as the main eventer. Even though, or nine, actually, nine. you could say nine. Uh, hey, you let me know, tell even, you something. Wrestling fans uh, were shit on this moment, but the first time I ever cried at a WrestleMania, a, a, a wrestling event, is when in WrestleMania nine, Hulk Hogan won the championship belt after beating Loco Zuna yeah. after the Bray Hart, I cried. And the reason I cried because I was crying of happiness because for one year, I didn't see Hulk Hogan in the ring. And I was like, yeah, we got Hulk Hogan back. And I started crying. And my dad being a very tough, my dad, you know, was, you know, born in Puerto Rico, uh, grew up in Harlem, you know, two tours of Vietnam, railroad guy. You know, he was not a sentimental guy and he did not take a lot of BS. So when he sees his little boy crying because his hero uh, is yeah. won the championship, you know, normally you probably think that he'll probably hit you upside the head and say, stop being a little punk. You know, I don't want to cuss, but uh, you would think something like that, you know, like stop being a little sissy, little bitch. Like, you know, something yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, but no, I remember my dad was like, Joey. Come here, Joey. And I was crying because I was so happy that I got my hero back. And then June comes around and he loses the belt and we didn't see him again. <laughs> I was like, and, and I was actually at that King of the Ring. They had it down in Dayton, man. Um, I Did remember you? like 
yeah, the photographer when he when he did that whole yeah. shoot when, and the flame oh, yeah. blew up, I was like, what the? F-? And and that same night was when uh, the Phoenix Suns played the Bulls. Man, they went to like triple overtime. But obviously, I had to miss the game because we were uh, and, at the match. Yeah, the man. Bulls the Bulls lost that game. Uh, they, they lost that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, it, the thing about it is, you know, people talk about that moment being the worst moment in professional wrestling or WrestleMania. Go back and look at the crowd when Hogan won the belt. Go back and look at the crowd, how everybody went crazy. Go back and when Local Zuna beat Hogan, look at the crowd, how everybody, kids are crying. P- people are like, what the, f- how, how? And then they talk about, you know, that's how they like these wrestling fans don't know what they're talking about. And sometimes I want to, and Clemson Tom at the moment, you know, he started watching wrestling when I guess when Stone Cold was watching it, uh, started. Yeah. For me, it caught, it was hard for me to catch on to Stone Cold because he was studying Steve Austin for so long. And then all of a sudden, you're some redneck from Texas. And I'm like, eh. But I, <laughs> I eventually caught on to, you know, I, I was on the Stone Cold train, but I was more of the rock guy. I love the rock. That was my guy. Yeah. Yeah, well, something to look at. Something I was going to say about Hulk Hogan, <laughs> he doesn't get enough like uh, credit for is that, I mean, he built up two wrestling organizations to the heights. Like he made WCW at a legit organization. And in I'm there, sorry, I was, I, when I was, he I was listening evil, to Jacqueline, Jacqueline, what did you say? Oh, I, I said that I, I could look at the rock all the time. He's, he's quite fun to look at. <laughs> He's getting alarming to look at now, honestly. It's getting, like, scary. His quads are a bit too big. Yeah. It's like 50. It's like, I need some of that. You know, I, I've never been a muscular dude. I used to be fat as hell. It's like, I'm getting in shape, but I want to be in rock shape now. Give me some of those, like, horse steroids or whatever he's taking. I need to get on that cycle. Maybe it's something about working out at 3 a.m. Didn't he have a peck job or something? Because like when he first started, he was like flabby when he was fresh out of like playing for University of Miami, you know, in his earlier days, he, he kind of had like moves. That's, that's, the, that's the rumor. No, no, no. That's just nutrition. That's just cutting. That's spiking up your carbs and then cutting them so that you're as tight as you want to be for showtime. Well, well I, my I wife, don't want to shit on Dwayne. My wife, my wife, uh, straight up, I, every time the rock comes on, I, uh, I got to turn it off. My wife is, she's, <laughs> she's all about Dwayne the walk. Jackson. She, I was like, Hey, 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 settle down. You could just help her out and get her a bucket and a mop. <laughs> whoa, whoa. It's so, hey, I, I tell you that she's raw. Didn't I, I told you <laughs> I mean, uh, she's, she's raw. She, she don't give a damn. Now this, this question is for both of you. Like, who would you say is the most iconic? Re- really say three. Let's say three. Three most iconic performers, entertainers, or athletes from the 90s. Well, we both agreed early on it was Michael Jordan, number one. No doubt. The, the Cinderella story, the, the, the float, the, the perseverance. Up until he started playing baseball, GOAT, number one, Michael Jordan. Um. What about you, Joey? What about number two? Uh, Michael Jordan, but I would disagree. For after you know he was the goat. After you know he came back from baseball, you know the flu game. The I used to tape these games. I mean, I used to have a whole library of NBA games and professional wrestling. So one day I can grow up to show my son, you know how great Michael Jordan and NWO and Bret Hart was back in the day. But of course, my son doesn't like wrestling or basketball. He don't like anything I like. But <laughs> uh, and I lost all those videos too. But yeah, Michael Jordan. You know the flu game, the all the fifty-five point games in Madison Square Garden. You know the go number two for me. Uh, you know, this is where he started losing his appeal. But honestly, history and uh, Invincible is two of my favorite albums of all time. So I will have to – and Dangerous. So I will have to say Michael Jackson, even though this is where it was the beginning of the end for him. 93 yeah. was kind of like the beginning. 94, in the 93, 94 with the – with the uh, – The allegations. You got to watch what you say with you two. You can't – you got to watch what you say. But uh, uh, with the accusations and him going to court and everything. So it was the beginning right, right. of the end. But for me, history – 
Dangerous, Invincible. Those are three Thriller. of my favorite albums of all time. And I can and those are albums that I can listen through all the way through. And Invincible is probably people consider that one of his worst albums. I disagree. And that came out in 2002. For, so for me, Michael Jackson was number two for real. I mean, I could, for me, okay. yeah, no doubt, Michael Jackson. I mean, number three, ja- number three, Jacqueline. Number three. Let's 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 go. Let's go with. Okay. Let's 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 turn it really hard into the teen bop. Let's talk Britney Spears. Let's talk about the eruption. That was the pop princess who changed music and what female vocalists could look like and sound like and the the social justice. It, let's go back to social justice. Let's talk about purity rates and how all of a sudden we were talking about what virginity was with our parents because we wanted to emulate someone. And the the mind that is Britney Spears. I mean, it's huge. That girl she, was she no changed virgin. MTV. You say that girl was a virgin. She said she was. She, but I think man. we've all said that at one point. Justin was knocking that out every night. Of course he was. It came out on 2020 later. Justin he was Justin. like, it's gonna be me. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, she did it. I don't know why I did the MJ for that. I was gonna say, but I was so good. <laughs> it's do y'all, do y'all remember do y'all remember that uh the Michael Jackson tribute concert? And he was on stage with Britney Spears. And I couldn't help but remember that he was dancing with Britney Spears. And he does this thing where he puts the hands on the girl's hips. If you go back and watch it, and you kind of had that look on Britney Spears, like, don't touch me. Like, stop touching me. (laughs) I don't know. I I watch everything Michael Jackson. So if you go back and watch it and watch the the, the original airing, and you can kind of see that Michael Jackson's trying to get a little close to her and stuff. And I'm sure they rehearsed this and everything, but on stage I c- couldn't help but remember Britney was kind of like, "Okay, your hands are getting a little low, don't <laughs> spoil them up a little bit." And uh, that I know uh, y'all, all three of y'all, looking at me like, "How can you remember this?" Like, it's geez. man, you know, I I I remember little stuff that people don't are aren't privy to, man. That's why I started a podcast um, <laughs> to, to, to reach out to other people who catch little shit, man. But like, I, I love Mike. I'm the biggest, one of his biggest fans, like a lot of people, man. But if I saw that version of him in person, man, I might shit myself a little bit. I feel oh, like what? everybody he was on camera with did. Like when he used to get paraded out with Lisa Marie Presley, it was always like she was there, but she wanted to like, she's like, be like five feet away from me, please. Hey, kudos to Michael for tapping that. I mean, she was I beautiful. They, but They said that it was that? a business arrangement. You know what? I would, I'll, I'll have that business arrangement any day of the week, especially back then. <laughs> you know, now I probably would cancel the check, but back then she was, she was a little bit of a hottie. And Jacqueline, like, like what? Oh, go ahead. She kind of looked. She kind of looked like a female Elvis Presley, and if that's the case, Elvis was, was high as a female. I was like, damn. Uh, Jacqueline, you, you're originally from Phoenix. Yes. Okay, and and you played a little bit of ball. I take it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I basketball was life when I was in middle school. Uh, I was convinced that at my five four self, I was still going to be the next Rebecca Lobo, and I was going to be in the WNBA and. You know, the summers out here are intense. And from sun up to sundown, I was on a court. Uh, my freshman year, I slept with a basketball in my bed. It was eat, breathe, sleep basketball. Um, yeah. You want to talk about 90s teams? Let's talk about the Phoenix Suns back in the 90s. That, man, you Woo! you two steps ahead of me. I was, <laughs> yeah. Because Damn, like. Marley. Marley and Thun- Ainge and Barkley. And, oh, my gosh. It was the dream team, including when they went off to the Olympics. Oliver Miller. That's a deep cut for y'all. Was it Kevin Johnson on that? Was yes, he KJ. was. KJ, KJ all the way. The, 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 the left off the off the cuff flush on Elijah Wine. I know, that's one of the meanest flushes. And, and I'm taller than Kevin Johnson. And he dunked on the like the greatest blocker in NBA history, Elijah Wine. Uh, I think that was the year Elijah Wine was the MVP. And, you know, I, I was a Phoenix Suns fanatic. A- after Jordan left, he was first and foremost. But when he retired, I was like, OK, back to Barkley. This is your time. This is your moment. But the, the Rockets, they kept getting in the way. 
But like growing up, idolizing Mike, how were you when it came to the Phoenix Suns and the Chicago Bulls in 90s, in, in 93? My love for Michael Jordan superseded all. I want to be, I want to be like Mike. Pow! Because he had a rough start and I had a rough start and I clung to him and what he was able to accomplish. And I went, well, shit, if he can do it, maybe I've got a chance. And so that would supersede the bandwagonism of, you know, oh, well, I'm from Phoenix. Of course I love the Suns. No, yeah. it was, this was, this was someone that I, I idolized their existence just because of their struggle. Like Mike is universal. You know, like what was it? A Gatorade commercial or Nike commercial? Like Mike, if I could be like Mike, I want to be, I want to be. Oh man. It was Nike. <laughs> Remember those Mike? Uh, you know what song I'm talking about? Commercials with the, I think it was him and Larry Bird, where it was like off the rim, off yep. this, off that, off your mother's head. Nothing. The early TikToks where it would bounce around. And it yeah. Just, <laughs> hey, y'all forget to mention the Dream Team, man. 92 Dream Team. Dude, well, you had half the, the Phoenix team. Suns on the Dream Team. Well, I mean, no, you no, think you didn't? You, you, you only had, uh, what, Barkley? No. Was it Marley on? Yeah. That? No, Marley, Marley was, was on, on the Dream Team too. We're talking about the okay. original Dream Team. The OG. We're talking. We're talking Barkley, David Robinson, Carl Malone, John Stockton, Michael Jordan, Christian Leighton, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Patrick. Yeah, we're talking about those guys. Uh, I, I do got a question. Do you ever notice? And you're talking about things that people don't ever no, pick up on. Mm. Do you ever notice when Magic Johnson does an interview about the Dream Team, and you can go back to the Hall of Fame speech about the Dream Team? All he wants to do is shit on Christian Leitner. <laughs> you, you ever notice that? Like, it pisses me off. I'm not even a Christian Leitner fan. I, I give two sh dams about Christian Leitner. But it just pisses me off. So, to like, to, I don't know why. It's just like Magic Johnson, a guy who won championships, Hall of Famer, you know, yeah. one of the greatest players of all time. Christian Leitner, you know, probably arguably the greatest college basketball player of all time, deserved to be on the dream team. Yeah. Uh, because he was the greatest basketball player, college basketball at player time. at that time. Yeah. And Magic Johnson just kind of just wants to take it away from him. Go back in YouTube interviews of Magic Johnson talking about the dream team. Everything is is like he can't help himself. He can't. He always has to talk about Christian Leitner. And you saw <laughs> in the Hall of Fame speech, he he was talking about how great uh, every player was. And then you can see Michael Jordan in the background kind of like, hey, he forgot to mention you. And Christian was like, yeah, I know. And then you hear, you see Magic is like, okay, and Christian Leitner. Yeah. I, 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 think know, yeah, I know you think I forgot about you, but I didn't. And after seeing all these great things about everybody else, he comes up with an embarrassing story about Charles Barkley, you know, bowing him and talking about welcome to the NBA. And I was like, what kind of dick is this guy? I mean, he, well, I, I honestly, I think it's become a running gag or it was a running gag with the team because, uh, you know, he was up for that spot with Shaquille O'Neal, Jim Jackson and Alonzo Mourning. They had a had a, a deep draft. Chris class. Weber. Chris Weber. And in hindsight, I mean, Christian Leitner is not the best, like as we see now out of that group. And Chris, he's the only one on the dream team who wasn't inducted as a as a solo player. Um, so, I mean, they he was yeah, the run of the litter. Yeah, but yeah, but then again, Jackson wouldn't have been, you know. Yeah, Jackson wouldn't, wouldn't have been better. No, uh, but uh, but at the time, Christian Leitner, it's not a it's not a secret. He was college basketball from oh, yeah 90, from from eighty eight to ninety two. You know, because uh, I mean, Duke was in two national championship. He was on the Arsenio Hall. Name another college basketball player that was on, you know, talk shows and you know stuff like that. So you know. It, it's just it pisses me off it gets to the point where it's like come on man let the guy have his moment you know? i agree i i mean because it's, it's not fair to him it, yeah, like he, he can't help it that he's not Shaq. you know he yeah. can't help it that he's playing with like the, this is the greatest team ever assembled like you yeah. could put together like everybody dead alive and throw the monsters as substitutes and the dream <laughs> team would still demolish them bro like like I, I'm a Cowboys fan, like it, better than any I'm Cowboys sorry. team, any Yankee. Yeah, me too. Any any, any Yankees team. Don't worry about it, man. I'm a Falcons fan, so I, I know I oh. feel your pain. So dirty yeah. bird okay. in the house. <laughs> the dirty bird. Yeah, yeah. That's hey, going back to the nineties. 
But uh, yeah. yeah, I just think Magic Johnson needs to grow up a little bit. It's just, just like damn. <clears throat> Lay off Christian. Give I was going to say you're live. sticking up for the Leitner hard, Joey. You must. You might be a fan. Are you a Dookie, Joseph? I, I know. <laughs> I, I don't. I never even watch college basketball. It just every time I look up Dream Team stuff is Magic, and I see a Magic Johnson interview. Everything that you know, all the other players won't even mention Christian Leitner. Uh, they just talk about the team. Magic Johnson goes out his way to bring up Christian Leitner. It's like yeah. what so, and basically. It, it, so, Magic, can you tell me about a time where you remember playing for the Dream Team? Yeah, oh, yeah, Dream Team was great. I wish Christian Leitner wasn't on it. I'm like, what the fuck? That has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> is, this, is this really happening? Is Magic Johnson just actively shitting on Christian Leitner like this? Like, just for no apparent reason. I've never seen and, him. Grow up. And you, did you hoop back in the day, too, or play football, Joseph? Oh, I was a football player, but my love was definitely basketball. I love no. basketball. I was okay. outside playing. I was never good enough to make the team. Uh, I was, but I would play for the boys' clubs and uh, rec leagues. And you know, I, I had a I had a good shot, but my dribbling skills was sucked. Uh, I love playing. I mean, every day after school, we the kids on Twentieth Street would go outside and play. And you know, it was like eight of us and. It was mandatory. As soon as we got off the bus, we put our books down. We go outside and play basketball, and that was just that was that was just that was it. And it was like we go into my friend's house. We used to as we used to find goals, (laughs) like we would go find basketball goals. We would go on people's property and play basketball, and no, (laughs) like like churches, and 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 the owners wouldn't even think of it. Like, oh yeah, oh no, no, they thought stuff of it. Oh, they thought stuff of it. I remember uh, we went to my uh, – it's now our church, but uh, – well, it was our church. Uh, my uncle found out that we was playing basketball at the church that he went – that they went to and I later became a member of. And uh, he got mad because that basketball goal, it was like private property. But, you know, we would go out at 10 o'clock at night to go – you know, we'll get our cars, the headlights on and play basketball. And my uncle told me, like, I do not want to see you back out there playing on that goal. And I was like, who are you? And I remember <laughs> we basketball and it was 10 o'clock at night. We used to go across the street was the Sonic and we go get one of those little juice drinks. And my uncle was driving by and he saw us playing basketball and he pulled up. And I remember just ignoring him. Because it's like, first of all, I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing up at 1030 at night on, you know, and why, and why are you staring at us? And I just I knew I was going to be in trouble. I knew I was going to be in trouble because he told me not to play on that goal. And I remember him just sitting there watching me and I just ignored him. And I thought he was going to get out of the car and beat my ass. But he didn't. Thank God. I'm sure he wanted now, to. Let's say you guys are drafted into the NBA. Or WNBA, and it, it's the '90s. And Morpheus, before you get drafted, Morpheus gives you red pill, blue pill. All right, one bill is like, okay, you can have a legendary Hall of Fame career like Charles Barkley or Karl Malone, but you never win a championship. Or you could take this other pill, and it's like you'll never be an All Star selection. You might not even start, but you could have the career of a Robert Ory or a Steve Kerr when you'll win multiple championships. Which more? Which is more important? Winning championships. Blue yeah. pill. I'll take Robert Urry's career over Charles Barkley's career any day of the week. Now, see, I'm going to flip if, it on you. And, and you want the you want the fame. You you want the the accolades. So you want to be Tom Legends Brady, not Dan Marino, guys. Like I don't want to be. I don't want to have like all the records, but no success. I don't know. But no, as a team, as a team player, I mean, as an athlete. A former athlete, as a, and especially I played in team sports. I had that mentality of playing, you know, for the team. You know, I would do, you know, that's why I think I, sh- I should have been in the military. I would have been a good soldier because I, I follow orders. I do what you tell me to do. And I would uh, definitely want to win. And if that means me taking the back seat, just like the CTS, I want CTS to win. And there's a lot of times where I have to take the back seat. You know, you know how many times I want to go on the Bama Standard and talk to Terrence Cody 
and and talk to all these Alabama football players and and meet you know going you know Jacqueline she's about to you know take over the Sunday interview and she's going to be meet interesting people. You got to take the back seat sometimes to win, and that's what I'm going to do. I, I have to take the back seat sometimes. So yeah, I want to win the championship. And, and that's and that's what team players do. Um, e- even if the stat sheet on your name just says three points, what if that was the scoring bucket? That was the that was the winning three pointer. Yeah, Steve Kerr. You know, bam, Steve Kerr, Robert John Paxson, Horton. John Paxson, yeah. another yeah, he, one. You know, John Paxson hit that uh, shot against. Uh, I think it was it was it, it was Phoenix. It, it was Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, because yeah, uh, Horace Grant passed them back to him. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, Avery from the Spurs uh, hit that game winning shot uh, with 11 seconds left on the clock in '99. Avery jo- or Sean Elliott, Avery you talking about? Yeah, Avery Johnson. Avery, oh, the the general. You know, he wasn't much of a scorer. You know, he became Alabama's head coach. But you remember the '99 finals? You know, yeah. after the lockout, he after uh, Jordan left. Yes, uh, the sports won. David Robinson, Tim Duncan, David Robinson won his first championship and then retired, I believe. I think he didn't, he didn't play the 2000 season. Uh, that was supposed to be John Stockton and Cotton Malone's year because Jordan was gone. And right. uh, Avery John- Johnson, who wasn't a scorer whatsoever, he was a bad scorer. You know, they they hit he hit a three and won the championship for the Spurs. So that's at least how I remember it. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, you are, bro. And you know, was I, it you seem like a nice guy, man. You know, <laughs> hey, man, we if we ever met in person, man, we'd be drinking partners, man. But it's Sean Elliott, bro. It was Sean Elliott. I said Chris it Elliott. Was Sean was it Elliott. Sean Elliott? I thought yeah. it was I, for the longest time. I thought it was Avery. I, I believe he was on that team, but yeah, no, he okay, definitely Sean. was on the team. Yeah, I, but I, I, as I remember the game, I, I, I thought it was Avery that hit the three with eleven seconds on the clock. But you could be right. Elliott was the killer three pointer. I mean, he hit threes like crazy. Because he, he just missed out of bounds, right? I know exactly what one you're talking about. Like, he, I think he, like, checked his foot, and it was, like, right there at the border. Yeah. And he was, yeah, man, in no time. I, that, this was the last game I'm talking about. I don't know. Like I said, I you know, my memories, with all the – since we're talking about the 90s, all the weed and drinking that I did <laughs> in the 90s, I, I, <laughs> I probably don't remember it uh, correctly, but – I. For some reason, I always in my mind I had Avery hitting that three. For some reason, I have to go back and look. But Elliot, you know, he was a killer. You talking about three pointers? You know, you yeah. around that league NBA. You talking about Elliot? You talking about Paxson, B.J. Armstrong? You talk about uh, Steve Smith, uh, Mark Price, Mark Price? Hell yeah, Larry, dude! Yeah, I mean, God, we had some kill three pointers. Danny exactly. Ainge, Thunder Dan Marley. Yeah, I, I bet Jacqueline was a hell of a three-point shot back in the day. I was scrappy. I was much better with a quick layup and being able to tuck back in. Throwing I'm bows. Oh, yeah. It was <laughs> – I got your elbows. <laughs> Blah. Oh, yeah. I, I was scrappy, but I was quick, too, so that helped. Were you a Rodman fan at all? I liked him for his bombasticness. Looking at him, I just thought, man, your mama must be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> All that talent, you're throwing it away just to have an ego trip. Man. He still got them rebounds, though. He, he might be crazy, but that's yeah, who he made. The, he made the Hall of Fame. I mean, he, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, the talent was definitely there, but, you know, rocking a wedding dress on the court, that was something else. Yeah, that was a bit extra. Yeah, oh, wow. uh, but you're, you're talking about the consummate teammate. Um, you know, that's somebody who didn't care about points at all. Like oh, he gosh. knew that there was strength in getting those boards, getting those second chance shots. And man, what better person or two people to give it to than Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen? To me, the the greatest dynamic duo in all of sports history. Um, but this you know, this is the same guy that missed practice. Missed, you know practice for the finals to go to a wrestling show which i didn't mind i thought it was cool because i was i loved you know, it like i said i, I was at nwo for life but yeah. rodzilla baby <laughs> Rodzilla. <laughs> I, I thought it was those weak ass elbow drops that he was given i can't remember who it was but when i first saw it like they jumped the guy and he was just giving them these weak ass elbow drops i'm like rod man you can do better bro <laughs> it, 
it was, and they were quick. They were like, like what? Virgil could have done that. Hey, I I was on, I was jumping up and down. I, I was yeah. I remember I still remember that night, and I was going crazy. It was just like when uh, Hogan the Rock came, went into the ring together for the first time. It was some sometimes it, some moments in professional wrestling for wrestling fans. You can't explain it, but the best way to explain it is like a big fight feel. Like, like when uh, you order your sixty dollars worth for a pay per view for a boxing match, and, and they got the natural anthem playing, and the guys are warming up, and the, you know doing yeah. doing their thing, and you know they're about to go in there and kill each other, and you know, and that's like wrestling sometimes can get like that too, especially with Brock Lesnar. God, the Beast. I like man. the Beast. Like man. the way they do it is smart because he's a man of little words. And he lets his manager do all the, the talking for him, which is how you're yeah. supposed to do. Like, that's the traditional, like, if you have a big, like, who, who's not good on the mic, you just get a really good manager. He doesn't have to say shit. Just look menacing. And he looks the part. I mean, Goldberg yeah. did that, and he didn't even have a manager. He just went out and was just a beast, and that's all he had to do, you know? <laughs> Brock Lesnar yeah. has one of the worst uh, accidental, like, uh, moves about when the one where he like tries to do a flip and lands on his head, but he's so muscular yeah. he didn't die. Yeah, that it. happened in 2003. I, I know that he got a concussion, he could have killed himself, dude. Uh, and Jacqueline's looking at us like, Is this a wrestling show? <laughs> yes, yeah. <clears throat> Jacqueline. Jacqueline I, she wanted to come you, on and talk about Lannis Morissette and TL and TL and TRL, and we're talking professional wrestling. <laughs> There's, there's a lot that happened in the 90s. It's okay. Man, and, and we try to cover it all. And, and, like, man, hopefully we have you guys back. But, like, th like, this is my last thing about, like, what you said about wrestling, man. Like, I miss the staples that were the songs of the pay-per-views. They used the same traditional songs for the Survivor Series, for the SummerSlam, and you would hear Vince McMahon's uh, voice in the backdrop because he could sell like no other because he would just hit SummerSlam with Earthquake and a Hulk Hogan. I miss that. But, I, like, ugh. Just want to get that out it. there. I miss it, too. I miss it, too. Sometimes, occasionally, they had that big fight feel like, Best example was John Cena and CM Punk. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And the crowd was crazy. You know, it, sometimes they get that big fight feel, uh, especially with Lesnar. Uh, but they, it's, it's, it's harder to obtain that big fight feel sometimes, especially with professional wrestling nowadays. But back then, especially in the 90s, uh, it was nothing for you to – you couldn't – like for me, I couldn't buy all the every pay-per-view. You had to you had pick to be and selective. choose. Yeah, yeah, you had to pick and choose. And but man, when you got that good pay per view, oh, it was it was like it was <clears> like magic. It was magic for real. <clears throat> pay per views were like golden ticket. I remember because my mom and dad would not buy them. It was like rare, or like we had to get another family involved to do it. Like get you know have a party. <laughs> a ten dollar buy in. Exactly, but like yeah. if you thought like you would even hang out. I remember a couple of times like somebody I didn't necessarily hang out with or even like would get it. And my friends would be like, we're going to go over and watch it. And you would even do that to watch a fucking pay-per-view. It's like, fuck this guy, but I can watch WrestleMania. I'm going to do that. That's how good wrestling. I won't do that now. I mean, I don't Wrestle, know, WrestleMania the wasn't negotiable. Now. Right, WrestleMania was not negotiable. Like, like <laughs> for my mom, it, it was like, you know, can I buy a pay-per-view? No, no. I had to come up with the money and give her the money. WrestleMania, even if I didn't have the money, I was going to order it. And we'll just have to talk about the fee later. Like, it was not negotiable. We was getting WrestleMania. I don't care what we have to do, what cans I need to pick up. Uh, I'm, I'm buying WrestleMania. And until and 2002, when I moved out, my mom found that cable bill. And she, you spent money on I told you not to buy that pay per view. And I was like, hey, it's WrestleMania. And then you move out on your own and you start paying your own cable bill. And you're like, hey, mom, can I get $30? <laughs> yeah, man. Start selling blood yeah. plasma and shit to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The blood bank. Like, it's WrestleMania season. <laughs> you got it. It's, it's like, Hogan, Vince McMahon. Let's go. 
Man, I, I always tell people growing up, these guys were my comic book heroes. Like I, I liked Batman and, you know, Superman was cool. But like, man, these guys were my like I looked up to them more than I would look at a comic book. I would get the WWF magazine faithfully. Um, Hell yeah. That, Hells yeah. WCW like, magazine, too. You had to buy. That's how crazy it is. Kids don't know what a fucking magazine is. Like you had to subscribe to see my promos. You couldn't get on the Internet and see what Hulk Hogan was doing. Yeah, you. And funny, they still sell magazines. And when Wild. Yeah, all the information is right here, I'm like newspapers, but they still have them. It's like, you know, I, like when I drive, I see some vehicles that I won't drive unless it has a clutch. But and honestly, is the clutch really needed? But like if I was driving a Jeep, I would never own a Jeep without a clutch. But really and truly, do you need it? It's like now, like, do you really need a newspaper? I mean, you got. You got this right here. Just I mean, they still print phone books. You know, yeah, they still. Like, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and the phone books on the and your phone books on here. It's right here. This is your phone book. Bam. Just That's go to post of a post apocalyptic firework. That's why they still print them. Because some people are stocking them up waiting for the collapse. They can have firewood. She's so they can like, build homes out of it and shit. It's like these are the bricks now. All these I, old phone st- books. Steven, are you on the West Coast too? Uh, I'm actually in Atlanta. Oh, so we're 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 neighbors. Yeah, okay, man. Part, I just what part of Atlanta are you from? Or if you allowed to say? Oh well, I'm I'm originally from Ohio. Me and him both, but I I moved here last year, and uh, I live in Doraville now, which is like uh, north, just a little north of Atlanta. Um, uh, my wife's from Snellville. Snell, I've heard of it. Like I, I'm reliant on my GPS a lot. So like I ask people like, oh, what side of town are you living on? And like immediately I regret why I because I have no idea where the fuck anything is. Um, so it, it's going to be a process, bro. It's going to be a process because I, I, re- I go home and come home. I, I go to work and come home. And like I put all of my time into like these creative endeavors, but, man. You know, the cool thing is Matthew and Steven, you know, you're both in like very good markets for what y'all do for this podcast. You know, you got Atlanta and you got L.A. And, yeah. you know, if anybody's going to be successful, it's going to be you guys. I mean, think about all the people you can talk to. And, you know, you, the, for me, living in Alabama, I got to like make phone calls to publishers and agents and stuff like that. Y'all can just go up to, you know, face to face. Ain't nothing better than in sales. Ain't nothing better than face to face sales. <laughs> you know, you can call. You can do whatever you want to. But face to face. Hey, I'm Matt. I'm Steven. Bam. Yeah. You're in the door. It makes so it easier work, if you man. reach out and like actually get a hold of something. Cause I've like, when I was first out here, this is a long time ago, but I don't know if you guys know who Joey Diaz is. He's like a comedian. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, he had a podcast out here that I listened to at work and uh, I actually just hit him up on Twitter. And this like, again, was like eight years ago it was before he got his big podcast, but I hit him up and just because I was in the area, I was, you know, I shouldn't have ever, no, I was not on the level to talk to him. He was way up, you know, out of my uh, area of expertise. But because I was in the area, I was like, hey, fuck, I'm like five blocks away. Like, let's let's meet up. But it does make scheduling a bitch when it's me and Steve and somebody like in a different time zone. And, uh, you know, like you'll talk to somebody that might be in the UK. So that it's just like, that's the one thing I hate, but. I mean, we're doing it, you know, we kind of went yeah. into a pandemic and it was like, let's start doing this shit. Let's stop and, talking about doing it and let's actually do a, a podcast together. So, hey, you know, talk, I want I want to ask you, go ahead. Go ahead, Jacqueline. I say, can we go back and talk about Joey Diaz for a minute and how it doesn't matter what show he's on? As long as he's telling a story, you're winning. That's why I reached oh, yeah. out to him, because I was like in my head that he had a show called Beauty and the Beast with a female comedian named Felicia Michaels. And that's all the show was, was him like talking about all his old stories, the ones that he's famous of telling. So I hit him up and I was like, this guy needs his own podcast. But unfortunately when I hit him up, it was like a month after the guy who I eventually like started a podcast for him had hit him up and gotten in contact. So he's like, I got nothing for you, boss, but you know, nice to work with you. So I did a couple videos, but it was a very cool experience. Very nice guy. Man, Where- you want to talk about living a life. Holy crap. <laughs> But he did give me a ride home one day when I was like uh, filming something for him. And it was the most terrifying experience of my life. Well, he'll make a body disappear. 
It was insane. He was yeah, driving no erratically. He, he ran red lights and like he wasn't putting anybody in danger. But if somebody got in like near him and like did something wrong in his estimation, uh, he didn't hesitate to say anything loudly out the window. <laughs> oh, yeah. He knows how to hide bodies for sure. <laughs> yeah, I got I got two questions. I got two questions. Uh, since you live in L.A. Well, first question for all three. You talk about nannies before I ask you the second question. Uh, best comedian in nannies. Oh, that's Martin Lawrence for me. Without Steve. a doubt. I would have to say Chris Rock. Jacqueline. Since like I'm Martin hosting Lawrence. the show now. Who? Martin Lawrence. Oh, okay. All right. You so uh, crazy. Just you, I I hear you, Steve, Chris Rock, but I feel like the 90s, Martin Lawrence was just nailing it. Maybe he nailed it too hard for a smaller period of time, but that just was he. That was his window. If we're talking everything else, I agree, Martin Lawrence, but if we're talking specifically stand up, just on stage, yeah. Yeah, like his like Chris Rock's quotables, man. He he had two specials, I believe, in 96. That 96 special. That yeah. 90, that's, yeah, that 96 special was like a masterpiece. Was that bigger and blacker? No, no that was, was like 99. 99. Okay. But, uh, Bring Home the Pain, was it? Yeah, yes. 96. Talking about the Clinton, uh, Al, uh, Al Doe, whatever his name Bob Doe. Bob, Bob, Bob Doe. Bob yeah, Doe. Bob Doe. Uh, and yeah. then he, the famous, nobody even knew what Tossing Salad was. <laughs> that <laughs> one. Rock. And friend zone. Like, no, nobody even knew what the friend zone was to Chris Rock came up with it. And you know, now it's like a common freight. Like everybody knows what the friend zone is. Uh, which Chris one was Rock he talking about? He was huh? talking about uh Mary and Barry. Was that the same one? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh Smoke Crack got a job back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I just remember talking, he was talking about the friend zone, and now everybody knows what the friend zone is. And he came up with that, you know, and tossing salad and like, I like to eat, I like to eat ass. And I prefer is jelly and syrup. Talking about prisoners, by the way. I prefer syrup. And just like Eddie Murphy and, and Eddie Murphy on, on Delirious talk about people will go around using your jokes. I just did that. And I just fuck up the whole bit. That's basically what I just did. I just fucked up the whole Happy. bit. It was funny. Go to go to watch 96 and you know what I'm talking about. But uh that's probably the classic stand-up HBO special of all time. But I will have to go Robert Shimmer, stand-up comedian of the 90s. Wow, that's a deeper cut. But I mean he's a he's a legend. He's funny. Yeah. He definitely is up there. He wasn't up at the top of my list, but I definitely would watch him. He had a good but HBO Steve, stand up. But special. Steven was smart. I mean, spot on with comedians like Chris Rock. That 96 special was like a masterpiece. If, if you ever want to know how to do a comedy special, go to 1996 Chris Rock. That was exactly what a comedy special was supposed to be. Now, something else but, uh, I feel about the. Uh, go ahead. It's the second question. Being in LA, that uh, you ever go to this comedy like improv in the comedy store? Oh, I, we go to. Well, we did. We used to go to the comedy store a lot. I've seen <clears throat> that place after podcasting made it big again. I remember one time we went and they have three rooms, uh, or did I think they actually have four now? One outside. Um, but this guy named. Um, Oh, fuck. I forget. He had like, I forget the guy's name. He's kind of a lower level comedian, but he had a show in the belly room, which is really small. That is just people doing new bits that you, they, you know, everybody had a notebook. They were just doing new material. And one night we saw Joe Rogan um, and like a bunch of people he was affiliated. It was just like going there. You're guaranteed to see an amazing show. So I like, yeah, we went there. I've been to the improv once. But uh, that's one of the best. That's one of my favorite things about living out here. If you like comedy, there's no shortage of that. I just L.A. is just something about California. It just gets put a bad taste in my mouth. I don't know what it is. Me, too. I've lived here a decade. There's a lot to not like about California. But, you know, to me, I've lived in Ohio, Virginia, Florida, out here. And... uh, 
I miss like all the small town stuff you get, like living in a place like Alabama or Ohio. Uh, but uh, it just you kind of have to find a good spot out here. We moved to a place called Long Beach. Home of, shout out Snoop Dogg, Cameron Diaz, yeah. represent. And uh, that's a good spot. But yeah, I get it. I know a lot of people that have left L.A. because of that. So I don't know how Jacqueline does it. Like I when I went, to, I've been to Phoenix a couple of times and every time you're driving, you just, all you do is see sand. And you, in my mind, when I see sand, I think beach. I think body of water. And I'm thinking I'm driving down the road and I'm seeing all this sand. And I'm like, oh, I want to. It, it subconsciously, I'm like, I'm gonna hit the beach, and I'm like, no, I'm in Phoenix. It's no yeah, they probably beach. do it too because uh, I was just, my, my wife's from the desert, not Phoenix, but the desert in California, like near uh, Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were there like a month ago. It was one fucking fifteen out. So Jacqueline's probably used to that. You're probably that's like you know sweater weather for you. And, uh, we just become <laughs> nocturnal. We just do everything once the sun goes down because it's still triple digits. But at least you don't have the sun, you know, just harassing you. It is wild. It I is. tried to go jogging one day when I was in the desert, and I was like, if and my, you know, I jog. I live near the beach, so I jog whenever. It's not that bad. I tried jogging like at eleven a.m. and I almost had to have my wife call an ambulance like halfway through the jog. I was like, this is. I'm, I'm getting old, man. What's Back that? In the day, I said, we're getting old, man. Back in the day, like me and my my wife and I just went walking this morning because I'm gaining a lot of weight because of this YouTube page. It's very, I sit down a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons why I got off the road as a private investigator is just because mm-hmm. I started gaining so much weight and I'm gaining weight again. So my wife and I went walking and we got these steep hills and it's 100 degrees outside. You know, difference between y'all's weather and all what, like me and Steven's weather is like, Y'all, the humidity. Like, yeah, yeah, y'all live in an oven. We live in a boiler. <laughs> you know, we, we, we like I always know, tell boil. people the air is sweating. Yes, like, and we, I'm, we're walking up these hills. I'm in my wife. She's, she's like Jacqueline. She, you know, she can, you know, five six miles of running. You know, just ain't nothing to them. For me, I walk a quarter of a mile. I'm like, <laughs> man, and. But man, we was out there this morning. And it was just like God. I, I I will kill this hill by 1999, you know, 98. I would have killed this hill. Now it's 2021. And it's like oh shit. <laughs> Where's my car? Go get the car, baby. Right. Damn. I gotta ask one thing before we kind of we got a, like a little question segment to end the show today. But Joey, before we like get to that. You've mentioned babies, that you're a the private. Inv- come from the stork. <laughs> okay, well, I I'm gonna ask I'm my wife to- what we can do about that. I, I never <laughs> thought about that, but uh, you said you're a private investor. We're a private investigator, sort of are now. Uh, uh, explain to me how you get into that, and can you share like maybe one insane story about being a private investigator? There has to be at least one. Yes, I can't put names in it, but okay, that's fine. it's funny because me and Jacqueline was talking. We started doing the interview about Scientology, and we, they were talking about how and like they get paid ten thousand dollars like an hour, and yeah, I, I, I shit. They, they were like, and the guy would ask Tony Ortega. He's asking me, "Was that good money?" It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but was it like ten thousand dollars a day? It was like ten thousand dollars a day, and he was at, he had the nerve to ask me was was that good money? And I was like, I got paid fourteen dollars an hour. <laughs> like, like, yeah, that was good money. Ten thousand. Uh, yeah, I'll do a lot for ten thousand. I'm not gonna. Yeah, I would. Shit, I would sell my soul to the Scientology uh, in a heartbeat. <laughs> Tony was looking at me like, like, would you really sell out? Yes. Tom Cruise and I'll cuddle with Tom Cruise in a Scientologist hotel room. Yes, no doubt. You know, hey, you know, people talk about lives, all these lives, all lives matter, blue lives matter. My mortgage company matters, you know, my 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 my, my kids' college matters, you know. I gotta eat. I would my tell health insurance matters. 
Yeah, I live in LA. I, I, the, the cost of living I, on a bad month, I might have to just walk out to the main street here and just, you know, pull my pant leg up a little bit and see if I can get some business because it gets to that point every once in a while. So I feel you. East Hollywood, I hear, is good. It's ripe for business. Hey, man. I'm too. Hey, you know, I don't. I don't think I fit the bill anymore. Thirty-eight, thir- twenty-eight-year-old Matt. Yes, thirty-eight-year-old Matt. Mm, so you got the mustache. Say, I was about to say. I. I definitely, at least here, look right on for a man. Oh, you know what? You you may be thirty-eight, but you you look you look no no you look you look a good thirty-seven. Thank you. I, I'll take that at this point. My wife calls you know, me old all the time. Reminds me that I'm an old man. So I she's just that. jealous. She's jealous of your good looks. Your 37 year old good looks. Listening, honey. Joey yeah. says I'm beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're the Green Ranger of the group. <laughs> I uh, appreciate a that. funny. I'm funny obviously story. the black one. Man. <laughs> Steve, <come> on. <laughs> you know, as a kid. I did not catch on till I guess you know they said that was racist, like the Black Ranger being black, the Yellow Ranger yeah. being ye- not to the movie, and I didn't catch on. I guess as a kid you don't catch on to that stuff because I was so like about the Green Ranger, I didn't give a damn about the other Rangers, so yeah. it's not like I paid attention. I was all about I, Tommy. I watched that show faithfully before school, and it went totally. I didn't even think about that till I was an adult. I didn't think about it till yeah. somebody told me. Was, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, and now oh, Power Rangers is racist. <laughs> Damn. But put so, somebody else that wasn't black in the Black Ranger costume and watch things implode. But that's true. The Black Rangers did become white, if y'all remember. I think he was like Latin. Was he like Asian? Was he? I don't I, know. I, I, I stopped don't know. after season one. Yeah. I, I, after top, after the Green Rangers went off and he became the white ranger i i was like okay i'm gonna watch it just a little bit and but by that, that time I, st- I was in my teenage years exactly and i was trying to do some mighty morphin muff diving yeah it was not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh you and jacqueline will get along just fine uh but funny oh, story <laughs> <laughs> funny story uh uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you two. I'll make them fast. Uh, one, I was in Alabama and I was doing a case. I was a little aggressive. I was parked a little close to the house. and But I thought I was far enough where nobody could see it. If y'all can listen to the background, that's my wife screaming at the kids. I don't know if y'all can hear. Can y'all hear it? I can't hear it. Oh, don't worry about it then. Don't call the cops. Anyway, uh, so I was I had my camera out and my camera was up on the top of my car. It was a company car, and I got some activity. And I noticed my claimant came outside, and he went back outside. But I kept my camera rolling just in case that he'll come back outside. And it was an insurance case, and I shit you not. His wife, who was a big woman, was looking at this little boy, and then all of a sudden she's like, "Turn your head." You, he, you can't. You just can imagine what she was saying, but she was like doing this to him, and the little boy turned turned around, and then all of a sudden you see her just put her pants down, and you see this big splash of water just come, and she was peeing. And I mean, it wasn't like you always imagine like somebody peeing, and, but I guess a woman's pee is different because I saw it firsthand at this point. It was like a baby's like her water just broke and I got this <laughs> shit on video and I'm sitting there like, what the fuck? Is, where am I? I, I was definitely into like the country part of Alabama and uh, that story. I did a domestic case where uh, it was funny. I can't go, like I said, I can't go into too many details, but one of the spouse thought that one of the person was, uh, was having an affair, which that person was. And I went to a hotel room, uh, and I can't, I gotta kind of watch what I say, but, uh, when I got to the hotel room, uh, 
the person with a spouse got a hotel room and I can't, I'm not going to say what sex or anything of the spouse, but let's just say that not one guy entered the hotel room, not two guys entered the hotel room, not three guys entered the hotel room, but four guys entered the hotel room. And when that spouse, and I shit you not, because when I got this shit on camera, I laughed my motherfucking ass off. When that spouse came out that hotel room, that spouse was having trouble walking. Oh, wow. You're the original, I, like, Joey Greco. You're like <laughs> Cheaters Alabama here. Yeah, well, I, was in, I, I was in Alabama on this case. Uh, but, no, that was probably the funniest God. thing in the world because, I mean, picture this person just kind of, like, walking like a duck. And well, I'm sure whoever <laughs> hired you for that gig was happy they did because, well, you, know, you know what? You know, I laugh. I laugh. And, yes, that is something, you know, you know, are, are you married, Stephen? No. Matthew, Matthew, you're married. Jacqueline, you're married. I'm married. Okay. For the person who who's like, you know, is getting cheated on. Yes, it's. It, but by the time you hire a private investigator, you pretty much know that person's cheating already. And in this yeah. particular case, that spouse already knew some type of activity was going on, and the spouse was not about you know. That person was already moving on. Yeah. That person just the the my my client just needed proof. Confirmation. And, yeah. Yeah. Confirmation. And that person got it. And it and and I'm, I'm trying not to give away too much, but that person got a pretty good kick out of it too. And that's why it was funny to me. And, you know, when you get something like that, for me, the, the cat and mouse game was so much fun for me. I miss it. I don't get to do it a lot no more because yeah. of my health and because of other stuff, you know, family wise. But, yeah, those two moments probably I got other moments, too. But those two moments stick in my mind. The time I saw a woman pee out in the yard and the spouse coming out of the hotel room walking like a duck. Due to the fact that there was four guys going into a hotel room, oh, and, I mean, they were laying pipe. Okay, <laughs> what now? You made the they were laying season. pipe. It was a plumbing job. They, they, what, what? They were laying. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it was. It, they needed to move a pool table out of the hotel room that day, and they, you know, those things are heavy. So there's a lot know, of heaving. I, That's you know why. I, yeah. I, I, this, I can't, like I said, I can't give too much details of the sex and everything, but just just imagine that it was a same sex relationship. This is all I'm gonna say. I think I gave yeah. too much already, and uh, yeah, but it is what it is. Uh, Apparently, it was, this is an exciting line of work, though. Steve. I think we need to start our own private investigation service. Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Jacqueline was like, I don't know, y'all missed it. Jacqueline was like, Yeah, you gave it like a little too much. <laughs> Just a little too much. Just a little bit. But no. yeah, it was fun. It was, it was good times. Good money. That that case gave me some good money. I don't know why, but like out here, I've been, been in between jobs and every once in a while when I was like thinking about what to do next, if I didn't have one, I was like, there's got to be a way to become a private investigator. I don't know why. It just seems. It's easy. Just, it's easy. <laughs> it, j- private investigator jobs or, you know, some jobs are like, I can't do that. I, I'm not qualified to do that. Yeah, you are. You know, just you have to like, for me, I was already an insurance adjuster. So basically private investigators go from private investigating to insurance adjusting. I went backwards. I went from insurance adjusting to private investigating. <laughs> and not only that, I didn't know the, that my being an insurance adjuster qualified me to be a private investigator. So I went one year to be a correction officer. And that was like the worst year of my life. Cause I was at a juvenile detention center. And that was the worst year of my entire life. That's when I realized I, I do not need to go back and finish my teaching degree. <clears throat> like hell with this. Cause those kids, I mean, I, I got scars on me, cuts, uh, just, it, it was just the hor- I went to work every day, but man, my coworkers did not come to work every day. I swear to God, it was the worst experience. That's another show for another time. 
That's that's the two thousand. That's the two thousand tens show. <laughs> there we go. What's that HBO show that we use? Oz? That's when we start talking about Oz shit. We really get into yeah. it. So we'll bring you oh, back. Uh, I can't. You know what? We've been talking for, um, for a long time. If we got to talk about Oz. I mean, Damn. that show was too we, we hot the, for me. I was too much of a fucking. I was too chuddy to watch that. It scared me. I, I loved Oz. I thought Oz was the shit. I, anything on HBO during the 90s was, was the bomb. Now everything is is. I have HBO Max, and I'm just like, uh, it's not my. I watch the movies, but anything on HBO in the nineties was was the bomb. I love HBO in the nineties. Great. Well, I, I w- we have a little segment, guys, that we like to do with our guests. That's just it's very easy. I got a big list of questions with numbers, and since we got two guests here, we're gonna let you guys both do this separately. So all you gotta do is pick a number. And then I'm going to read that question to you. It's usually 90s related. And uh, just give us your answer to that question. Very simple stuff. So, um, Jacqueline. Number 27. 27. So, I'm sorry. Also, 1 to 50. You picked within that. So, number 27. Jacqueline, this is great. Fuck, Mary kill. Uh, Danny Tanner, Uncle Joey, and Uncle Jesse. Fuck Mary Kill, Full House of Dish. Where oh, are we at? This, this is easy. This was a cakewalk. Uh, we are definitely fucking Jesse from Jesse and the River. Um, we're going to marry Joey because he's funny. And we're going to kill Danny because that is a swear. Wow. Danny, sorry, Bob. You're out. But I like those things. I mean, who's not going to fuck Jesse? I, now that I see this question, I'm like, even me. Like, that, that was a giveaway. I'm sorry. So he's timeless. I mean, he's aged to like fine wine. And I mean, in terms of a white guy doing that, I, I can't think of anybody else. So I haven't seen Uncle Jesse in the last year, but I can only imagine that he's just oh, he's killing it. He's got a two year old and he looks like the same as he did back when he was on Full House, but just better. Famous here. John Stamus. <laughs> All right. So we got Full House cover. 27. Seven? No, I was, <laughs> no, I was just I said twenty-seven. No, go ahead. Go what ahead. what no. you pick a number? One through no. 50. one through fifty. I okay. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I want I want to fuck Mary Kill Jesse. <laughs> uh uh, okay. Uh I would go have mercy. I wanna go. You know what? We talk about Michael all day long. Let's talk, let's go to twenty-three. Twenty-three. Okay. Have we actually figured out what the fuck an umbop is? No. No. I, I guess I you know what? My wife probably knows what umbop is. I mean, this what is Hansen doing now? Are they alive? I don't yeah. know. You gave, you gave me the worst fucking question. You I'm sorry. This is why this is a random this is a random it, draw, my she, friend. She, she's Jacqueline right now is fucking Jesse, and I'm I'm talking about umbop. Hey man, <laughs> the, that's not fair. <laughs> Man, it was like fuck Mary Carol. I didn't mean Carla I can't Anderson, make you Sonny, question, or Sable. You talking about some fucking umba. Well, I'm like, okay. I I hear I acknowledge it. And now we're gonna let you repick. Let's see, let's see what you got. Sonny. I'm afraid to. Uh, fuck Mary Kill. Tiny Tim. Like, no. <laughs> I don't want to play. I have some more, please. Fuck Mary Kill, the cast of Oz. Yeah, the cast of Oz. Fuck. <laughs> you could do fuck Mary kill the girls of friends. No, that's you, okay. That's okay. We're, 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 we stick one, you already did twenty three. That's off the. I board. did twenty three. Uh, I, I, well, did he know what <laughs> umbop is? I, I guess if we listen to the lyrics of the song, we'll figure it out. But you won't. I don't know. I don't. I I didn't like the song, and nor you weren't a handsome no. guy, Joey. You, you, <laughs> you know, I did like one song Hanson did. I, I forgot the name of it. Yeah. I forgot um, the name of it. It it was kind of rockish. It had a little good thing to it, but it wasn't Umbop. Well, I did like Umbop. Nelson. I don't know if y'all remember Nelson from the early 90s. Uh, 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 was it Ozzy and Harriet's son? Uh, no, it was uh, something. The grandsons. Uh, no, the son of uh, that rock star. 
the, that Rick, in Ricky Nelson. Yeah, yeah, Ricky Nelson. He's he, he, yeah, yeah he's twins. the son. He's the son of the Ozzy and Harriet, which was like an old sitcom from like the fifties in the black and white yeah. days. Uh, yeah, and he, uh, Ricky Nelson. Yeah, he was like a teen star. Yeah, and then uh, he had two twins, and they became rock stars in the early nineties. I thought they were yeah. kind of cool, but uh, no, we don't. We don't. Unfortunately, I do not know what Umbop is. Okay, well, that we don't got that etymology down for Umbop, Steve. So we didn't tackle that one. Um, so Jacqueline, we're gonna go back to you. Let's get one more uh, number here. Hopefully. You know, it's not about Uncle Bob. Okay, <laughs> cool. Let's try number 11. Uh, okay. Uh, which of these 90s toy trends do you feel was more ridiculous? Beanie Babies or Pogs? Oh, I think the Beanie Babies were ridiculous because no one ever brought their Pogs to a divorce proceeding. You have clearly yeah. weren't in my first marriage divorce hearing because that was all it was. Exactly. I actually worked retail <laughs> when Beanie Babies were a thing. And I remember people would call and bombard and stalk the damn gift shop waiting for this shipment of these tiny little toys. And then McDonald's came out with them. They were ridiculous. And you really couldn't do anything with them. Not that <laughs> you could do much more with pogs, but you know, you could carry 100 pogs as opposed to 100 Beanie Babies and still walk down the street. Yeah, I mean, Pogs, I feel like also the shelf life of that trend was like six months. Because I got, I bought into Pogs hard right away. I was like, oh, shit. And I had a, the slammer. I had the fucking. Did you have the binder with the, all the little slip-ins? No, I had like the weed tube, like medicine thing you put the okay, Pogs in. Okay, that was the one that went to school. I had the binder at home for the ones that I didn't want to have anything happen to I did oh, wow. have a fucking badass slammer that had a actual scorpion body in it. In was like it metallic? Acrylic thing. So yes, yes, the shiny slammer, a hundred percent. So you know, okay. So pogs, you're out. Fuck pogs. Yep. Uh, Beanie babies. The one thing I'll say about Beanie babies, uh, people made some legit money off those. I don't think anybody other than Jonathan Pog or whoever invented pogs made any money off of that, but. You know, there were some people making some serious money off them Beanie Babies, so. It was the precursor to Tickle Me Elmo being the hot toy. So, so you said fuck Beanie Babies, right, Jacqueline? Well, yeah, those, they, those were the ones that were ludicrous. Gotcha. I mean, okay, so there you go. I'm not going to go too hard on Pogs because I feel like everybody's already done. That's like the fucking uh, God smack of trends at this point. So, um. Joey, pick a better one this time, bud. <laughs> All right. I guess we're going to stick with Michael Jordan. 45. 45. Going deep. Okay. Oh, fuck. I think we could go I around the horn on think. this. Is very, see, you're picking very tame ones. So, uh, but what was your go to 90s after school snack, Joey? I grew up poor. I'm just lucky to have a snack. I guess uh, peanut butter toast. Dude, there we go, guys. That's what that's my still go to. I'm a 38 year old man. That's still my like snack. That's my thing now. So I don't know. Joey Never coming in from football origins. practice, eating some fucking peanut butter toast. That's a con that's a good protein snack, Joey. You must have been a fucking beast. Oh man, I ain't gonna lie to you. Back in the two days, I used to before I go to practice. I would put a two liter Coke inside the freezer and now, you know, in Alabama it's hot. And then I'll come home, take the two liter Coke out of the freezer, fill my tub with water, <laughs> sit in the tub with my son burnt, burnt ass and drink my two liter frozen Coke. <laughs> that was, that was a, that was a, a moment in time. I don't know if I can do that now. I'll probably have a diabetes stroke, but it's a hot, but it's a nice hot bath and a, a, a cold. You know, the water was cool. It was okay, cool. okay. Nice. Cool. I'm sorry. You're yeah. right. This is athletic. This isn't just, just Joey time where you just light some candles and no, that came in, that came in, <laughs> that came in like 2000. That, that's in the, once again, that's the two thousands. Okay. That's in more, that's more mature. Joey. <laughs> uh, 
Well, Steve, should we go one more round on these? Should we? I mean, we're getting let's, some good answers here. We, let, like let, we, let's do one more again. Okay, so Jacqueline, one more. Hopefully, right, let's get let's, spicy. I might just pick a spicy one if you don't. Please pick a spicy one. Surprise me. Well, you asked for it. I did. Uh, did you watch the Pam and Tommy sex tape when it came out? No. Female perspective. I, see, I think everybody else here did. So I, you know, I can't speak for Steve or Joey, but so I, for reference, uh, growing up, there were seven of us in a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment, so privacy was not really mm. a thing. So mm. having a spare moment to even see something like that just never existed in my world. I yeah, knew that, that the tape existed. I never saw it. That's a tough one. That's a tough one to sneak. You know, there's well, no. I, way I would. I will say this, Tommy Lee made everybody insecure. I mean, yeah. if you can steer a boat with something other than your hands, I You're mean, all right. all I gotta say. <laughs> a, a lot of those drum solos in Molly crew were done with his, with his joint, man. Yeah, I, it's pretty impressive. You know, <laughs> yeah, all with his unit. I, you know, as a teenager, when that video came out, I was like, so that's what's going to happen when I become an adult. Can't wait. No, it didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, still I still have time, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, well, Joey, I'm trying to find a real spicy one for you here. Uh, but I'm just going to pick one that's near and dear to my heart. Did, did you play video games? And what you I still play video games. Okay, Sega or Nintendo I'm a sports right guy. now. I'm a sports if you I, had I'll to play shoot one Sega or Nintendo in the nineties, you didn't want it. Which is the was, one you're gonna you want? I guess I was a Sega guy. I, that's where I started. That's my origin story. I eventually was a Nintendo person, but my mom and dad got me that Sega Genesis with Sonic the Hedgehog two, and I just that was my shit. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the one I got too with Sonic the Hedgehog two. And my son loves Sonic uh, the Hedgehog, but uh. That was the one I got with Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and I killed that game. But that wasn't juicy. That's usually I, I mean, I, I'm not going to say – I don't want to, like – We like, went with I, want, I, wanted, I wanted something I couldn't let my kids hear. Like, you know, yeah. no, don't go back to the list now. It's over with. You, I mean, you I, I mean, I, all I'm seeing is a lot of guy stuff. I don't know. Fuck, Mary kill. Get, Backstreet Boys are in sync. I don't know if we want to know what Joey was these, thinking about that. See, <laughs> see Jacqueline, Jacqueline get the fuck Jesse – and I, I get um bop and, and Sega Genesis. This, I mean, this is honestly, my go away when I and, and peanut just, butter toast, and yeah, peanut I mean, butter toast. <laughs> and, and right now, Jacqueline's got Jesse. Jackie's the spicy one of this dude. Joe, fucking Joey's over here just eating peanut butter toast in a bathtub. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> in a bathtub full of Pepsi. Ah, ah yes, yes. <laughs> Well, that's it, guys. That's all the questions I have. Um, but before we go, please like plug all the shit that we possibly yeah, all the, the CTA we everything. Can find you. We got a lot of shit to plug. Jacqueline, go like go. Let's go. Let's start with growing up. Uh, oh, oh, damn, I, damn it, girl, okay. fuck your shit up. My baby. Uh, so we've got my book, Grown Up Growing Pains dot com. For Comfortably Uncomfortable, The Road to Happiness Isn't Always Paved. Uh, you can find it in print on Amazon. You can download it to your e-reader or your Kindle. Or if you don't mind the sound of my voice, I will tell you my personal story on audible.com. When I'm not promoting my book, I'm helping Joey out on CPS channel. I am taking over the interview room, bringing hard-hitting interviews with interesting people and interesting stories. That said, I do love the sound of her voice. That's why, that's why she's on the team. Uh, she's not only my hero, she's somebody I look up to. I guess that's the same thing. But with that said, the CTS interview room, uh, we got Stephen Smith, Stephen M. Uh, Stephen M. Smith, Steve Brown, all SEC linebacker Marvin Constant, Justin Riley, Internet Sensation Stingray, Clemson Tom. Jacqueline Phillips and myself. I hope I'm not leaving. And Raphael, oh, my lovable cousin Raphael Lozada. Uh, CTS interview room. You can catch us on YouTube. CTS interview room. You 
there's the Bama Standard. There's the third and three. There's O episodes of Top Ten. There's the Sunday Interview, which Jacqueline's taking over. Uh, just go check it out. Subscribe, like. Uh, please subscribe. You know, my kids want to eat. You know, just and, and plus these people want to get paid one day. So <laughs> the more subscribers we get, <laughs> Jacqueline is not going to be, do, be doing this for free much longer. She's only been doing it for two weeks now. She wants to eat. So please subscribe now. Heard. Well, that was Joseph Lazada, Jacqueline Phillips of CTS Interview Room. And in Clemson time, Hulk Hogan walked so that Stone Cold could run. So what you going to do, brother, what happened in the 90s at CTS Interview Room? Run wild on you.